All right, welcome to the podcast, Fred and Casey. We have you guys in today. Thanks for showing up yep. with the Fixed Ministry. Thanks for having so, us. So for people who are here, um, who are tuning into the podcast the first time, have never heard of the Fix, sure. give us a rundown. Um, you start. <laughs> so the Fixed Ministry is a discipleship program for individuals who struggle with substance abuse, um, any life-controlling mm-hmm. issues, men or women, um, and, and it's faith-based. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is the Fix. Amen to that. Yeah. Fred? Um, if I could add anything to that, um, um, Christ is a cure, man. Yeah. You know? The now, you God, guys so. you guys are obviously kind of intimately familiar with that answer, if you will, coming sure. from a background that's a little bit um, atypical, I guess. I mean, I don't know really. Would you even say that now? I mean, so many people have interesting backgrounds. Yeah. And then, you know, coming to Christ. You weren't... Born and then raised in the church. No, no, Mm-mm. right. I um, I think my first experience uh, in church was, um, I was in a drug and alcohol program, and on um, Sundays we really didn't have anything else to do, so we would go to a church because they served a meal. Yeah. How so, long ago was this? Um, that was probably two thousand. <laughs> Um, first experience would have been 2008, 2007. Mm-hmm. Um, I went through a program called the Healing Place in Richmond. So we'd go to off uh, uh, First Baptist, which is down there in um, south side of Richmond, yeah. in the morning because it was within walking distance, mm-hmm. and they had great scrambled eggs. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I talked to a missionary one time in Africa. Yeah, and he said, uh, he said, you know, it's great that like. These Christians send like these big food donations and stuff like that. But he was like, "We we call them rice Christians." And I was like, "What do you mean rice Christians?" And he was like, "You know, basically, you get hundreds and hundreds of pound, you know, of rice, yeah. and you bring it to a village, and all of a sudden, everybody wants to become a Christian, Christian. you know, because clearly you come yeah. to church and that's when you get right. you get fed. And then when the rice runs out, yep, you know, they're gone. They run out, and, and you know, but the thing is, it's not different, right? Uh, same thing here. Yes." Yeah. You yeah, I, I would call it, um, you know, you see a lot of that. Um, you know, we do uh, a downtown ministry where we preach God's word. And um, there's a lot of ministries I would call them toxic. Mm-hmm. You know, they they ride around, they hand out food, clothing, um, but there's no m- a ministering of the word of God. Yeah. Um, and you know, the word says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So, That's right. So, so have you have y'all ever heard of IDES? No. So it's an international disaster emergency service. Yeah. And uh, anybody listening, look it up. I think it's odds.org or odds.com. I think odds.org. Um, but they're a Christian church, Church of Christ based, yep. um, you know, faith based organization. Guy started it probably back in like the 70s, I think it was, mm-hmm. maybe a little bit earlier. I should know this because I traveled for them for a summer promoting them. So I had to tell this story over and over. And you and, don't know it? Well, that was 2006. <laughs> Seven, 2007. Mm. 2007, I did this. So that's 13 years ago. So I traveled for them, VBSs, you know, church events, all this sort of other stuff, promoting them. You know, people usually were already supporting them and just kind of giving them an update of, um, you know, what what the organization was doing. Yeah. So the guy started it out of his house back when you used to have to make, like, collect calls, um, you know, to dial long distance and stuff like that. But uh, he, the reason why I like the organization is because their main focus is disaster relief, yep. but as an avenue to preach the gospel. That's it. So they always end with the gospel. The gospel. They don't just go, hey, we're going to come in and like, you know, this tornado swept through your town. Right. We're going to clean it up. We're going to build your house. And then, hey, Jesus loves you. Bye. Yeah. Like they will plant a church yeah. or they will leave a preacher there who can go to a church that was destroyed and then rebuilt or to start a house church or whatever it was, yep. you know, the gospel, so the gospel's the the center. Yeah. So they really, like, they talked to me about that before I even started traveling. Like, we we need you to emphasize this point. Right. And I was like, good. Like, that's, you know, yeah, y'all know yeah. who I am. So, yeah. you know, I'm, to me, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like, right. you, you have to. Right. Um, so why don't y'all uh, kind of express to, you know, anybody who's listening, why is it that y'all have a heart for this sort of ministry? Sure. Um, I, I'll start. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I you know, I came out of a background of drugs and alcohol, mm-hmm. so I, um, you know, I kind of um, started to dabble um, with 
that lifestyle uh, in my early years of middle school and the high school. Uh, graduated uh, the school that I was at, um, addicted to heroin. And, you know, that, that uh, part of my life was um, who I was for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And it, it brought me to a point of um, jails, homelessness, and um, it was God's word. Somebody came into the jail and preached God's word. And um, I can remember going back to my cell. Um, it, of course, you know, God, I think, was nudging me long before this mm-hmm. happened. Um, but, you know, I went back to my cell and picked up a Bible and just never put it back down. So I think that's that. that it, it, and what God brought me out of, uh, where where Christ found me, um, um, That that's where the heart for this type of ministry came mm-hmm. from. So, have y'all ever seen? Um, y'all know Zach Williams, the yeah. Christian artist. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he has this one. I, I don't know if it's a CD or it's like a collection of songs. But he went to a jail. Yes. Yeah. Y'all know what yes. I'm talking about. <laughs> yep. And um, you no know, I mean, it's, a slave. <laughs> yep. A fear. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And it's so cool, you know. And that's what I think that um, people, you know, Christians. When I say yeah. people. I mean, like we're talking about Christianity here. Those who are involved in church, you know, the, the kind of typical like, hey, maybe I was raised in it or I started going when I was younger right. and, you know, no sort of like what we call, quote, rough background, right. you know, or anything like that. Um, Even though everybody, we all understand everybody has their problems. Yes. You know, some people yes. get caught, some people don't, no. you know. Right. It just looks different. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, You know, but, but being able to humanize yeah. people, because it's very easy if you've never, you know, I mean, most people have never been to jail. Right. right. Like, I, I don't even mean, like, I got arrested and went to jail. Right. But, like, how many people who haven't been arrested have gone to a jail? Right. Visited it. Right. Talked to people. Anything like that. Hardly any. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. So it's almost kind of like that's a that's a different world. Right. You know, it's, it's almost like they look at it like that's a, that's a different world. It's like, you know, you could talk about, you know, being on the moon. I don't even know what it's like. I don't even know what to, yeah. to experience, you know, to think about. And I think... That, you know, Christians who have that sort of sheltered way of being a Christian, yeah. you know, when you when you look at the Gospels, you all know this, mm-hmm. right? I mean, where did Jesus go? Like, he went to the rough spots. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. and I just, I think so many times, like, when he went to visit the uh, gathering demoniac. Yeah. You know, like yep. this this guy, like you look at the description in the in the Bible, and this guy is like breaking chains. He's like cutting himself. Like yeah. people can't be around him; they're freaked out by him. And he's like, "Let's land the boat right there." Yeah, mm-hmm. you Let know, me talk to this guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, chain breaker, right? Yeah, no longer absolutely. slaves. Uh, Zach Williams songs. It's it's just like rehumanizing people. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you I, know, I think that um, if we don't understand something. Uh, we tend to demonize it mm. instead of humanize it, mm. and I, I see that a lot. I, I, see, I even see that um, with people who have walked um, with Christ so long, they forget what God saved them from. Yeah, and, and it's like they start to become judgmental, forget what God has done in their life. They become ungrateful, and ultimately, I think that leads to. This Pharisee way of thinking. Mm-hmm. You know? I, I mean, I can yeah. tell you. I mean, full disclosure. I think I went through a period like that in my Christian life. Yeah, I know, you know? I do all the time. I think we all do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I uh, I can remember distinctly kind of thinking about you know that very thing, like like in preparing lessons and sermons and stuff. Yeah. Not saying like I'm going to preach against other people, but like right. trying to reflect. Yes. And having that thought, like, man, you know, I've I've come out of the world. And I've become a Christian, and now I'm kind of like caught up in this church bubble sort of thing. And I forget sometimes yes. what it's like to be outside that church bubble, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. And it's so imperative. If you're going to do ministry, which every Christian should be involved in ministry, Yeah. right? Yeah. We're not just talking about like full-time we're, voca- we're called vo- to vocational ministry, ministry yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> but, you yeah. know, every Christian needs to be involved in some way, shape, or form in a ministry, yeah. whether it be in a local church or, you know, yeah. church-related things that are happening. Yep. Um, the advancement of the gospel. Yeah, and it, to keep you connected to the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't mean like morally. Right. Right. No. But 
remembering, you know, it's about people. Yes. And what's the, the old saying? Um, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's one of my favorites. I love it. Yep. And something else about ministry is while we're, you know, I was reading Matthew where you were talking about that, where, where Jesus said, you know, you go to the prisons, you go to the poor, you go to these people, you go to the least of these, mm-hmm. and yeah. whatever you do for the least of these, you've done for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we talk about that. and um, But really, at the end of the day, we're not just helping them. If you look back, it's a reminder of that's where we came from. Yeah. Because yeah. It easy, it's easy to get complacent and realize that, you know, oh, well, I'm good now. I'm saved. But when you go back and you help other people, you realize that could easily be me. By the grace of God, there goes I. Yeah, so. yeah I've heard that exact saying before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people, I think people don't realize just how close they are to be in that very thing that, you know, we talk about dehumanizing. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know? And so, like, y'all specifically deal with people who are recovering addicts and things yes. like that. It's so easy. So easy. If you've never been affected by that, if you've yep. never had a family member, a friend, an acquaintance, or anybody who's been affected by yep. that, to look at it like, wow, I can't believe they would do that. Like, you know, they don't have any self-control. There's right. no discipline there. Yeah. Like, blah, blah, blah. Right. But, I mean, it, addiction's addiction. Yep. You know, whether it be to drugs Alcohol, your cell phone, or TV, food, food Facebook. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean you anything. name it. <laughs> it's you all, it's, it. it's, you know, it's all the same thing. Yeah. You know, and I, me- I remember uh, one time there was a, uh, I got a buddy. He's a little bit older, maybe like 10 years older than me. Um, his wife is probably like, like, you know, one of the, like super, she's got a halo. You know, it's like she yeah. walks around, there's like a halo on her head. She's so holy. No, for real. Like right. she's super, super sweet people. And I remember um, we were at like some church camp event thing right and uh you know so we had the we had a little picnic table set up and then we had the food out on a little fridge plugged into the outlet and we had a coffee you know we're making coffee right yeah and um i knew that she liked to to drink coffee so i'm like hey you know now i'll get you one you know and and she's like no no no, I, i'm not drinking coffee and i'm like what's i mean going you know it's like what's up with that <laughs> you know and she's like i she was she basically had gone through school to become a counselor and she said, I was, I realized that in talking to these people and all of their issues that I had this deficiency in mm-hmm. myself mm. where I was basically addicted to caffeine. Yep. And I was like, Ooh, Ooh. you know, because Conviction. to me, well, and to me, I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I've got an addiction to caffeine, but, right. uh, <laughs> you know, I like it. Yeah. Right. Same but thing. isn't that the same thing? Same yeah. thing. I, I think, uh, you know, my big joke now is food, mm. you know, and. Like I tell people jokingly, but I'm not. It's like all I got left is food. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's not the right way to think. You know? But that's what you do is you substitute yeah. one for another. another. I tell the guys yeah. all the time at the house, you just put down the fork or you put down the spoon and picked up the fork. Uh-huh. You know? yeah. I think it's like the you know when you go to the fair, there's that whack-a-mole game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, that's like our sin life. You know, you, yeah. you knock one down, pop, oh, pops this one. You yeah. know, you just constantly just... Yeah trying to get a hold of it you know yeah so so i I think it's a i think it's a very arrogant attitude yeah to have you know to to look at people who are recovering you know or even people who i wouldn't even say recovering like what about people who are still addicted right you know like i can't tell you i mean you guys you know y'all know i deal with you know these people who are in this sort of stage of life as well in a different capacity that's it you know but i meet people who all the time like are thankful that i'm arresting them yes because they, they, you know, they know, like, I don't want to be doing this, right. but that's the, that's the power right. I, I think of that addiction. F- for me, um, you know, I, I've, I've gotten to points where I've uh, been arrested and, and at that moment, it was almost like um, this, this sense of peace came over me because yeah. I, I know where I'm getting ready to go mm-hmm. and I'm not going to have a choice mm-hmm. and, I'm okay, I, and I'm grateful for that, mm-hmm. you know, because I, I, I think for um, addicts, a lot of people don't understand that 99% of them know they have a problem. Yeah. And, you know, for years I was looking for um, not somebody to tell me that I had a problem because I already knew that. Because yeah. I wanted to stop. <laughs> right. Just, I, I need a solution. Yeah. yeah. What, what is the solution? Mm-hmm. Because everything I've tried is not working. You know what I mean? So I, I think that's key, you know. Um, and... That arrogant thing you're talking about, like I've had conversations with people um, who would look at me and say, well, Fred, that guy relapsed. He's not saved. 
Yeah. Mm. And then, but then we, you know, a day oh, later, I'm having that. a conversation with the same person. They're like, well, you know, I, I've canceled pastors that, that keep slipping off into porn, and these guys are men of God. And yeah. I'm like, well, did you just hear what you just said? Mm-hmm. That doesn't make any sense to me. I, yeah. I, listen, I, I could not agree with you more. You know, yeah. on, on that very thing, like it, it's almost like, you want to smack somebody in the face. Yes. And, and, you know, I mean, I know you're not going to, but it's right, almost like right. you get so frustrated because you're like, do you really look at that sin? Yeah. But then you're going to like, you know, the yeah. whole like, you're going to look at the speck in your brother's eye, but then, right. but then the log that's sticking out of your right. eyes, right. it's all good though. You yeah. know? And, and like you said, like if people, I mean, all you got to do is go, go look at the studies. I mean, you right. look at how many, how many preachers and ministers in any oh. capacity are addicted to pornography. Right. It's, 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 hor- it's horrendous. Yeah. Horrendous, you yes. know. But we'll and, call them men of God. Sure. But if a guy that slips off into relapse on drugs, yeah, we're gonna question his salvation. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. like <laughs> it's like sin is sin, man. Yeah. You know, it's it's um and, and even more so, you know, I'm um and, and I'll tell you about the the class I'm doing, right? So we're yeah. doing, you know, we're going through Leviticus right now, and it's a reminder of there's a different sacrifice when a leader sins. Yes. Mm-hmm. Compared to when a regular community member of God sins, right. and it's a bigger sacrifice that he has to make to bring to God to say to make you right with God. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> more of a payment yep. because God requires more of leaders. Right, and it says that in the New Testament, right? You yeah. be held to a higher standard. So shouldn't it be yeah. the opposite? Yeah. <laughs> Right. Should, shouldn't it be like the guy who is a recovering addict who's trying to get right. out of it, trying to climb out of it, trying yes. to fight it, trying to move? You know, it should be more grace to that guy. Whereas yeah, right. a leader, it should be like, yeah. hey, you, you're a higher level, right. dude. Yeah. You know? You should be more mature than this. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. I agree. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's sin, right? I mean, I think sometimes people say, well, sin is sin. Well, yes and no, right? Like sin is sin. Different sins are characterized in the scriptures. Yes. You know, in the sense of, you know, God. Sexual immorality. I mean, there's yeah. sins leading to death. Yeah. There are sins leading to death. death. You know, there's doctrinal sins. There are right. even moral sins that are worse than other moral sins. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I'm okay. But at the same time, we're all struggling. We're all, the, the yeah. universal fight of the Christian is Romans 7. Mm. You know, yeah. the, the good I want to do, right. I'm not doing it. Right. And the, the bad thing I don't want to do, I find myself doing, doing that. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and then... Yeah, Paul knew the struggle. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, and 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 two, I mean, this gets into so much other, you know, the theological points behind it is, I think God actually views people differently depending on how far along they are in their faith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I've been a Christian now for almost 20 years. So if I do Sin X, yeah. and then this guy who's six months as a Christian does Sin X, right. I think God's going to hold me more accountable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, because you got more wisdom. Yeah. You got more knowledge. I mean, I've been around longer. Right. I should. I should be past certain. You right. know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying like, oh, I'm more holy than this guy. Yeah. It has nothing yeah. to do You're with that. You're further along in your sanctification process. I uh, should be. Should be. Well, and I mean, scripture <laughs> talks about how he who is given much, even more will be given, and he who right. doesn't have anything. You know, when you talk about the talents, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, when you bury your talent, then, um, you know, God will even take that from you. Yeah. So, but he, if he gives you more, he who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. much. So if you're not faithful in little, you're not going to be faithful in much. Yeah. So, Fred, you um, you said at one point you were homeless. Yes. Right? What was that like? Um, How long were you homeless? Well, I can tell you as uh, hard as I think I am, I was not cut out for that life. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I got to a point in my life where I was... Um, you know, I was put under uh, authority um, to follow rules like in a program. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I refused to submit. Stubborn. Stubborn. I like so, it, like, man. We're the same heart. Yeah. So, like, you know, like, I wasn't allowed to have a phone in this program um, or a way to communicate. Yeah. You know, but I, you know, I had one. So you know what I mean? All the time. What you're saying is people can actually function in this world without a cell phone? Yes. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Revelation, guys. Yeah. Revelation to anybody out there. Yeah, so I had this little uh, iPad that I could text on and get mm-hmm. on social media, and um, I kept getting caught with it. So every time I got caught, I'd get 30 days in the street, 60 days in the street, Dang. 90 days in the street. Um, so I, I would say on and off, probably six to nine months in and out off the street. So, yeah. Um, 
you know, I slept uh, uh, over on South Side off Commerce Avenue a lot, which was right near the, the program. So mm-hmm. even though I couldn't be in the building on the property, they would allow me to come eat, you know. So, um, and, and believe it or not, you know, you know, you see a lot of stuff on, you know, social media, but um, there are so many places in the city of Richmond serving hot meals, you'll never go yeah. without one. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, that was taken care of. Um, and I've just kind of stayed to myself. There's a couple other guys that I hang around with, but you know, like it was hard. Like it, when you're outside, um, it's hard to get clean. It, it, it's once you get cold, it's hard to get warmed up. Yeah. You, you know, you, in the summertime it gets so hot. It's, it's just, it, you know, yeah, you know, it's hard. So, um, you know, but it, it didn't take me very long of living that type of lifestyle to realize that that's. Um, not what God had for me. That that was not God's plan for my life. And so when I was in Maryland, we did this thing called Winter Relief every year. Yeah, where we were part of like a group of churches that would bring in like you know you had to apply, the the people who were homeless had to apply, but it would right. be like about thirty or forty of them right. the entire winter from like October through like March. Sure, you know it's so like a pretty long time. Right, mm-hmm. and you your church would take a week and you would house them. You would feed them, and then during the day they would go out, yes, do like, whatever they like got. Like a do. night shelter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that way, during the cold time, they had somewhere to stay. Yep. They had a hot meal. They could shower. Yep. You know, get clean. Yeah, the churches yeah. would donate them. You know, toiletries and clothes, and you know, backpack, Take care whatever. Take yeah. Care yeah, 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 yeah. Help them out, right? Yep. I can't tell you how many of them I would sit down and talk to. Yeah. You know, and they would just be like, "Oh man, I'm like, I'm good with this." Yeah. Like they figured out how to survive. Being yeah. homeless, and I think, yeah. I think that's um, that's key. I think the success that we see downtown are people um, that haven't conditioned themselves to be homeless yet. Yeah, mm-hmm. like they are like in the the throes of you know having a, a normal life, and it's starting to transition into this homelessness that they're uncomfortable. It hurts, and if if you can reach those people in, in that yeah. period of time. You know they're more apt to, you know, um, listen to you because yeah. like pain and uncomfortability mm. is a catalyst for change. That's it. And and you know yeah. that's one of the things when we deal with like like parents with the fix. It's that you know they want to fix their kids. They want to um, you know they want to keep them from being in pain when when really that that could help them change. That's the catalyst. Once you have had enough pain, you've had enough. Um, you just being uncomfortable in your situation then you'll want to change. That has to outweigh it. The uncomfortability right. of change has right. to outweigh the uncomfortability or the comfortability of your misery. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, and the thing is, that goes true even for people who are Christians. And yes. I mean, you get beyond yes. like being homeless, right. you know, yeah. addicted to drugs or, right. you know, like, oh, all these bad sins, yeah. you know, like right. as if any other sins are not bad. But, right. you know, you, you get to the point where let's say you got a guy who uh, grew up in the church, yeah. right? He, mm-hmm. Like the worst thing he's ever done is maybe like say a curse word in his life, right? Whatever. Yeah. Um, and so then he goes off to Bible college, he gets into ministry and then like, you know, he's just cruising, man. Like, you know, seven, eight, 10 years into ministry, he's kind of been at the same church and all of a sudden it's like, oh, how uncomfortable would it be to take, you know, my family, the ministry I'm used to, the church I'm used to, and then move to go do something else that God might be calling me to do. That's Jonah. Yeah, right. So I mean, but yeah. but 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 a lot of people don't do that, right? Because they don't want to be uncomfortable. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. I, I believe that that it, ministry is uncomfortable. God doesn't call us to comfortable. No, right. he nope. doesn't. Right. And that's probably that's the Ameri- biggest. That's American Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to have this comfortable plush life and serve Jesus too, yeah. and that's nowhere in the scriptures that I can find. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I think the church is in for a rude awakening here. Yeah. The way America's headed. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that, but here's the thing. I think there's a silver lining, you know, and, and one, one of the things that, you know, anybody who's been a Christian for any amount of time or has taken Christianity seriously for the time they have been a Christian will understand the church has been through worse uh, societies, yes. have lived Absolutely. under worse times. Nero. Yes. I mean, a lot worse. A lot worse than yeah. what we're dealing with. I mean, with. You, you, you got this guy who's <laughs> literally putting what? Christians on the stake yeah. and then lighting them on fire yeah, for his Roman for his, candles. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right? You're right. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I even think about, like, uh, what about, like, Ezekiel and those guys? Off in captivity. Man. You know, Daniel, Shadrach, John Meshach, Baptist. and Abednego. Yeah. Yeah. 
It's like, and, and you think that Christianity isn't going to be able to make it through whatever right. America is going to do. You can't right. stop God's church. No. I mean, it's... The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nazi Germany. Yeah. Right. Right. That's it. No, I mean, I get it. A lot of Christians lost their lives. Yeah. yeah. You know, Christians were thrown in jail. Yeah. Christian, you know, I get that. But I think through persecution, it strengthens the church. Yeah. It can. You know, I, I really do. I think that um, American churches, and I, I don't mean to go into all that, but no. like... <laughs> I, it, it's getting it, good now. No, oh, like, yeah. It, it, it's like this this consumerism, and, mm-hmm. and it's like this show, and they're, they're there for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. And I, I truly believe if any type of persecution comes to the church in America, you're going to see their... You it, separate the sheep from the goats. Yes. There will yeah. be a sifting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think the downside to persecution, like when you talk about persecution, let's yeah. distinguish here, right? Like we have, I think right now you could say there's, quote, persecution. Yeah. I mean, you have some political persecution happening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you have some, even some economic you know, right. I mean, you just take a, you, you like the the court cases with the guys who are Christian bakers, and you know they right. have to take their businesses are getting shut down. They have to go yeah. to the Supreme Court to try to fight these battles. Yeah. You know, or even like what's happening with John MacArthur out yeah. in California right yeah. now. Yeah. That's persecution. Right. They are Absolutely. they are specifically targeting his church. church. Right. Yep. You know, and so you have that. We yep. don't have Christians being dragged out in the street right. and Flaw killed and for being a Christian. Christian. Per se. Right. Yeah. Per se. Yeah. Yet. Yeah, it might come. It might not come. Right. But I think the downside of that is what happens when a guy like a John MacArthur yeah. gets executed in the night. Mm. Yeah. You see what I mean? Because now that church can lose that influence and that life yes. of ministry, that wisdom, that yeah. teacher, that, all that you know, all that stuff. All those years that he spent building those relationships, and now you somebody else got to fill that role. Yeah. So while in one sense it so can, who's going to fill the role? Yeah. Right. And I mean, we know God's always there. Jeff Durbin, you heard that guy? Mm -mm. Apology at church. You need to check him out. Jeff Durham? Durbin. Durbin. D U R B I N? Yeah. Yeah, Or Ian. One of those. He's from Arizona. Arizona? Arizona. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, he does a lot of outreach, a lot of uh, street ministry out of his church with like abortion clinics. Mm. You know, so he's, he's getting a lot of heat too. Yeah. You know, so. Well, you're going to just, I think that part you're going to see more of. Yeah. You know, and it's going to get to a point where Christians are going to have to realize that while we can use as much tact as we possibly can muster, yeah, at some point or another, we're going to have to take a stand for certain issues, right. and the world's going to hate you for it. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, but that's part of that being uncomfortable. That's it. Well, I mean, they hated Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah. You know, that, why do we think it's we? I think that we find it, and it's over and over in Scripture. We get so confused at why we get persecuted, and and like we're seeing very little, like the most probably we've ever seen in our lifetime. But still, it's very little in comparison to what you read in Acts. Oh yeah. It's very little persecution than than what we read about. But Jesus said it would happen. Mm-hmm. He said, "If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you." Yeah. Right. I think it's it's. Um, you know, the persecution, like we're speaking about persecution and being uncomfortable. Um, you know, for for me, um, I find it easy to uh, be uncomfortable, like financially. Yeah. Stepping out by faith. I think we're um, comfortable being uncomfortable. But like when we <laughs> start to stand on the truth of God's word um, and, and speak out on certain issues and we, we start to face opposition that way, like people not liking us. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. That kind of uncomfortability too. A lot of people will not step out. You know. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I struggle with that. I think everybody struggles with people pleasing. Yeah, I mean, you know? I, you know, we were created to be creatures of community, right? right. It's the church, right? Yeah. I mean, so it's it's difficult, you know. And and the people who like, I remember when I was younger. You know, in the arrogance of it all, you're like, oh, I don't care if people don't like me. Right, hey, right, but and, you do. Yeah. yeah. In, in a sense, you do. <laughs> yeah. Right? But in another sense, to act like you don't, right. you're a little me bit too. more bold, you're a little bit more tactless, you're a little bit more yeah. uh, offensive right. when you don't need to be. Yep. Right? You're trying to prove something. Yeah, 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 like you're trying to prove something. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's difficult because you want people to like you because right. you go, oh, well, if... If these people don't like me, they're not going to listen to me about the gospel. Yeah. But that's not always the case. Right. That's up to God. Yeah. Sometimes it's the people who don't like you who see that, just that constant character you have yes. of being 
down the line, you're, you know, you're not going to treat them with disrespect. You're not going to be hateful back to them. You're not going to spew hate to hate. You're not going to take vengeance. You know, you receive the the hate. And then all of a sudden out of that group of people, you'll get a few who'll be like, all right, something's going on here. Right. You know? Yep. It's like it piques their interest. Yeah. Yeah. And you see that in the guys too, like at the house. So, so yeah. yeah so let's talk about that, right? So yeah. the guys at the house. So, right. so you guys started the fixed ministry. How yeah. long ago did y'all start that? Uh, it was June of 2018, so a little over two years. Now, did y'all start it at the house down in King William? Um, yes. So it, it kind of came out of the downtown ministry we do. Okay. So that's kind of where the you know that was birthed. You know, like people were uh, responding to the gospel, uh, homeless, drug addicted, and we. You know, I've worked diligently to get them in programs, but, you know, you found that there was not a lot of faith-based programs, yeah. you know, around Virginia. Um, and if there was, there was a huge waiting, like, period. Yeah. So, so you um, saw a need. I saw a need. And, like, and then the money. Like, how do you, you know, homelessness, like, the dude ain't got money to pay to go into a no. program. Like, no. Like, how's that going to happen? Yeah. You know, so, like, this one guy, I won't say his name on camera, but, he came up and gave me his drugs and his heroin during a sermon one night in Farmer's Market. And then he got sober, was showing up, and then he showed up about two weeks later high, and it broke yeah. my heart. Yeah. And I had been diligently trying to find him a place to go and couldn't couldn't make it happen. So kind of out of that, we, we did the fix. So, yeah, so, yeah and because and, I don't want to I don't want to leave the downtown right. thing, right? Like, right. I want to talk about the downtown yeah. thing because people don't know about that going on either. Right. But that's that's also, like, the where I just want to, like, yell it out right. to, to people who have, like, grown up in a church or maybe they, they just gone to a church in, like, let's say a, a nice area of, like, you know, Western, West End, Richmond yeah. or Hamrica or, you know, uh, Hanover, even here in New Kent or whatever. You're kind of, like, you're near Richmond. Yeah. But you're still kind of detached from Richmond because you don't right. live there. You don't commune there. You don't yes. do church there. You don't yeah. shop there. I mean, you might right. go downtown to eat or watch a movie or grab right. some ice cream or whatever, but that's not where life is, right. right? And so it's almost like you forget like how bad things can get for other people. Yeah. All right? And so right. like I remember talking to this one person. Again, not going to say their name on yeah. camera, right? Super nice woman. Yep. I, you know, I'm good friends with her, good friends with her husband sort of thing. And she, like, she asked me one time about, like, I mean, she had the right heart about it, right? right. Their church was trying to do something yeah. um, in kind of like a county that's around Richmond. Yeah. And was like, well, you know, what what like, what like bad things do we have going on here in our county? It's, it's almost like she really didn't... She was out yeah, of touch. touch. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's not like she was... I don't mean to put it like that, but I mean, she was legitimately trying to... To understand. Yeah, she was which seeking, is good. She was seeking right? understanding. But that's the thing is like, you know, from my job right now, being in law enforcement, I see all the things that happen and then like just know 95, 98% of the people in this county have no idea what we just did. Yeah. Like I was going... So the other day I'm off, yeah. right? And I was like, hey, I, I got to go get some do- uh, deer corn, you know, for, for the deer or whatever. Yeah. So I'm like driving over to Tractor Supply. And so, you know, I take the road, I go down there, and all of a sudden, I'm coming back. And when I'm coming back, like, they have the interstate shut down. Yeah. Firefighters and cops. And I'm like, ooh, that must be, like, a really bad accident. You know, like a tractor yeah. trailer probably flipped over or something, whatever. Right. And Not whatever, but, you know. Yeah. It's, okay, that's that's terrible. So I go home, do my thing, and all of a sudden, like, people start texting me, like, hey, what's going on over here in this neighborhood? I'm like, what? So I pull up, you know, our, our system, and I look at the, the notes of the thing when I go back to work the next day. And there was a guy who would have had abducted a four year old. Wow. I think it was like his kid or something like that. But yeah. you know, whatever. It's like he didn't have rights to the kid. So right. he abducted the four year old and then they got in a pursuit with him. He ended up crashing right here, you know, in New Kent, and then he ran through the woods with the kid, had a had a knife on the kid's throat, you know. Yeah. And they, yeah. they were able to end up getting him, you know, nobody was hurting or anything like that. But I'm like, even me, being in law enforcement, right. I like literally drove within three, four hundred yards of what was going on. At the time it was going on. Right. And had no idea. And I'm just going to trash supply, doing my thing, and then yeah. going home like, I wonder what those, all those lights were for. Yeah. yeah. And then I think about like all those times when we're doing things that's not during the day, things that might happen at nighttime, and people have no idea. You know? Yeah. So it's like people people who grow up in church or who are just in church or whatever, and they just kind of live in these nice little communities and this and that. I mean, I'm not trying to, not trying to be super critical. Right. All I'm saying is it might be a good reality check to think about what is life like for those who aren't as well off as I am? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And then how can I go minister to them? Yeah. 
because it does open up your eyes yeah. to like what everybody else is going through in this world that you right. maybe just by the grace of God haven't had to go through. Yeah, I, I think um, it, it it absolutely goes to where Paul said, "Be all things to all men." Mm-hmm. That's always ministered to my heart. You know, I've heard I've heard very uh, liberal Christians say, "Hey, Fred, why can't you go to the bar and drink beer with somebody and witness to them?" And you know, my response to that is, "This is going to sound crazy, mm-hmm. but like, would you go into a crack house and smoke crack to reach a crackhead?" And, and I'm not doing that. Like, yeah. that's not what he means. But but we should always put ourselves in other people's shoes mm-hmm. by by seeking to understand sure. their life and what they're going through and why they act the way they do and I, I just think that makes um, it softens our heart mm-hmm. as Christians mm-hmm. because our hearts become hardened to certain things um, even even the home and me going through homelessness drug addiction heroin alcohol my heart can become hardened if I if I'm not seeking to understand mm-hmm. that other person. So, um, you know, I think that's so wise. Like, I think, too, we get, and we, too, get self-absorbed sometimes in our own lives. Yeah. yeah. And instead of, you know, really, like you said, seeking to understand somewhere else, someone else. Um, and it's easier for us because we've actually been there. We've both been homeless. Yeah. We've both been yeah. drug addicted. So it's easier for us to put ourselves in their in their shoes um, but even still, we have to guard our hearts constantly because we get, I mean, we get offended. We get yeah. people take advantage of us. Mm-hmm. You know, we get all those things that we used to do to other people. Now people are doing it to us. And it is easy to get hardened tor- towards people. Oh, but yeah. you have yeah. to stay constantly yeah. esteeming others more highly than yourself. Yep. You know? Oh, yeah. Hard to do. <laughs> oh, it's definitely hard to do. Hard to do. <laughs> Some people are uh, yeah. EGR. Extra grace required. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. But that's mm-hmm. kind of like that's where you know the, the fixed ministry was birthed out of. So. Yeah. So you guys were y'all were downtown Richmond. Yeah. Here in Richmond, Virginia, and y'all are. I mean, I've been. I mean, yeah. Chelsea. You know, we we've come down there a lot, and uh, yeah. unfortunately with COVID, we haven't been able to make it down sure. a lot. But um, so y'all are basically just in a parking lot. Yep. You know, a couple pop up canopies. Yep. Got a little external speaker with a yep. microphone and just yeah. sharing testimonies. The word. Yeah, um, you know, serve a hot meal. And one know? of the most beautiful things about that ministry to me is that the guys that are in the discipleship program in King William, they set up the sound system. Yep. They mm-hmm. they set up the food. They serve the food. Oftentimes they're cooking the food. Yeah. Um. And and so it's like the same guys that are coming off the street are are learning about the Bible. They're learning about Jesus. They're coming to know Jesus. And then they're taking what they're learning and they're discipling other men. Putting it into action. Yeah. So that's the most beautiful thing about it to me. It's like this, it's discipleship. You know, for me, like one-on-one discipleship, Mm -hmm. you know, so. And also like, even if a guy has not fully received what the gospel, Mm -hmm. um, them seeing the gospel played out, not only uh, Fred yelling at them, mm-hmm. but seeing seeing that love in action, sure, um, and them them getting outside of themselves and um, you know helping somebody else, yeah, um, it helps that come alive. You know, yeah. helps that that knowledge that we're pouring into them mm-hmm. become become Walking a heart condition. Out. Well, if it was only about communicating um, facts, yes, then you know I, I don't think God would have ever really needed to come That's it. be a man. I mean, even if you yeah. want to say, well, he needed to be sacrificed. Right. Okay, well, he didn't need to do all the ministry things he did. No. He, he just, didn't need to heal people. Come die. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just come down here and go, here, look, I got a pamphlet for you That's guys, it. and then uh, where's that cross yeah. at? There's a track. <laughs> yeah, see you later. Yeah. yeah, but what did he do? You know, he yeah. he embodied That's the it. grace. Yes. You know? He showed us how to, how to do it. walk it out. Yeah. yeah, you know, so perfectly. Did yeah. y'all ever have the? Um, did y'all ever have the thought? Like, I, I'm not saying you yeah. did, right? But did you ever like think to yourselves or have the doubt and go, "Man, we just don't know if God can use us because of our past." <laughs> Every day. Every day. Every day. <laughs> um, you know, I'll share a story. Uh, it, it's. Um, you know, I, I got to go to a conference one time. This is not very recently, like within the last year. And, um, you know, we uh, went to uh, a guy who's speaking. 
um, who was the dean of um, Southeastern. You know, oh, that big church? Uh, Southeastern about- Seminary, which oh, is, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. Isn't that like in or Louisiana or not Kentucky, Louisiana, Kentucky, yeah. yeah, Louisville, something yeah, like that? Yeah, then I, you know, then I'm sitting at the table and he comes and sits with me with these, these guys who got doctorates and, mm-hmm. you, you know, and he's like this double doctorate and, and they're asking me about my ministry that God's put me in. And I'm like, you know, I started comparing myself. Like, I'm like, God, why do you have me here with these guys? I, I'm just not qualified. I'm underqualified. I, I'm just... You know, this drug addict that's found Jesus, and I, I just don't even deserve to be sitting at this table with these men. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I, I think that's something that I struggle with. Um, you know, especially like when, um, you know, you see failure. You know, you see you see things that you could have done different. Sure. Um, and then, you know, you start to listen to the voice of the enemy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you, you're not called to this. You, you know, you're, you're fooling yourself. Um, so that's just something that, that I, I, I personally deal with a lot, you know, so it's a lot of prayer that goes into that and a lot of just trusting God and his word, you know what I mean? And, um, I, I think that, um, if it wasn't for the failures, if it wasn't for what I've been through, mm-hmm. that, that I would not be even equipped to do what I'm doing right now. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I have to hold on to that, you know? So. He definitely uses what what we meant for evil, what the enemy meant for evil, and uses it for his good, yeah. for his glory. The world and he uses the, the foolish things. I say that all the time. Yeah. That's one of my favorite scriptures. I'm That's so glad that God uses the foolish things of the world, or else I would be unusable. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so. Yeah, I I um I was thinking about two verses, like you know I mean we've we planned this podcast out what a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> excuse me. So. I, pl- I was thinking, like, um, about y'all's ministry, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, part of this this podcast, and people are probably going to hear me talk about this on all these podcasts, is, like, I'm, I'm trying to promote what other people are doing in the kingdom. Right. You know, I, w- I want people who are who are actively working in the kingdom to get exposure and help their ministries to grow and, you right. know, all this sort of other stuff. So I was thinking about the fix, you know, talking to you guys about it. And uh, I, I was like, you know, I wonder. That's why I asked y'all. I was like, I wonder if they've ever had that thought. And I'm like, I'm sure they've had to have, had that thought because I know the same yeah. way with me. Um, you know, while I haven't had as um, hard of a path as you guys have had. Like, I still wasn't like you know the the stained glass saint. Yeah. Growing up, um, but I thought about two major scriptures and one, you know, the Isaiah six, right? I, Isaiah sees the glory of God, yeah. and he just immediately recognizes how unworthy he is yeah. right. to see that. But then the cool part about that, and I always think about my buddy, um, Brian, um, Brian Harris, if you guys you know, may or may not have ever heard me talk about him, but he's, he's Isaiah. Okay. Yeah. So he is the guy, um, when God's like, Hey, I need somebody to run through that brick wall. Right. And Brian goes, here I am, Lord, send me. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. actually, actually what Brian would do is he would run through the brick wall and then look at God and go, here I am, send me. Yeah. Like, yeah, Brian yeah. does before, you know, but I, that's why he's so great for the Lord is because yeah. he just like, yeah, man, we're full steam ahead. Like, yeah. God's going to get this Let's done. Do this so I think about Isaiah, you know, in the sense of like when God asked him that, there's that little detail that a lot of people don't focus on is that God took the coals and touched it to his lips. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because Isaiah said, well, I'm a man of unclean lips amongst people of unclean yeah. lips. Right. And God is, I, I think the message here is God is saying, listen, you're not you're not equipped in and of yourself to do this ministry, right. you know, but I'm going to be the one who's going to equip you. Yeah. You know, and then when Isaiah goes, well, what do I tell him? And God says, well, here's the message I want you to go preach. So not yeah. only is he cleanse him so he can be the guy who goes right. and does this, but he also gives him the message. But that all started with Isaiah being willing. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people like. That's why I, that's why I bring it up. Right. I want, I want people who maybe younger guys who are thinking like, I want to go off the Bible college, but I don't know. Like, I don't know if God could use me or they just want to do something in their church, but they're like, I don't know if God can use me. It's like, listen, if you're willing, God will use you. Yes. I don't care who you are, what your background is, where you've been. Because even when you look at what you guys have been through, y'all can minister to people in a way that like I never could. I've never done drugs. Yeah. Okay. Right. Never touched them. Never had a desire to. Yeah clearly not judging people who have right right because i have my own issues right um but you know it's like y'all can y'all can minister to people in ways and minister to people yeah in ways that i never could yeah 
right? And then uh, one of my favorite books in the Old Testament, which a lot of people probably would be surprised at, is Amos, right? I am surprised. Here's the reason why. Uh, I like it simply for the fact that Amos, when he goes down and starts to preach to the people, uh, to the leaders, really, you know, and they kind of like give him pushback. He's like, listen, I'm, I'm not I'm not a priest. Yeah. Like, I'm not, I'm not a prophet. Right. I'm not a, I'm not like a leader up here in Israel. Like, I'm a tree farmer. Yeah. But God told me to go tell you all this. So I'm coming yeah. down here to tell you all this, you know? And yeah. that's, that's how I feel. I'm like, yeah, listen, yeah. I'm not, like, I don't, you know, consider myself like a preacher or, right. you know, like, oh, I'm a, I grew up in a, pre, you know, yeah. in a priestly family or what, right. you know, it's like, listen, man, I, I'm just, here's a message I got to tell people. And so right. I'm going to do that in whatever yeah. way God uses me. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's important. Like, me too. Same story. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you see that, though. You see that for people who don't know about the fix. Yeah. I think they need to go look it up. You know, like <laughs> yeah. when you get done listening to this podcast, right, whatever right. point you turn this podcast off, off right. you, need, you need to go look at the fix. Because yeah. it's like what you guys are doing downtown in Richmond and then also with those guys at the house. Yeah. It's like you see this amazing ministry that was birthed out of nothing. Yeah. But people simply looking at it and going, there's a need, and uh, I'm going to ask God if I can fill it. Yeah. And then you just see God do the rest. Yes. Yep. Then you see God put people in your life. You yeah, see God's him. still doing it. Yeah. You know I what I mean? don't know how. <laughs> yeah. I don't. Every yeah. day I'm like, how did we get here? Yeah. I mean. How did we get here? You know, like, it just it's amazing to me to see um, how God has orchestrated it and still orchestrating it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I said, we take guys in. We don't charge them anything. Um, and the the way that God has provided for the ministry, um, it's wild. It's wild. It's only God. It's, it, it's mind blowing to me. Yeah, you know. So, um, I, I think out of obedience to God's word and just um, making it about um, about Christ and, and uh, bringing people out of bondage into new life in Jesus Christ um, is, and, and that's just as simple as the vision has been. Um, and like, for me, I don't look at like, uh, you know, we're treating drug addiction, uh, which we are. Um, it's about, um, men coming into a home and us discipling them to a point where they could possibly, um, if God laid it on the heart and they they put their yes on the table, mm-hmm. God could, God could use them the same way. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like breaking that stigma. Of like these Absolutely. drug addicts and these alcoholics, man, they'll they'll never amount to anything. Yeah, like I, I you know, I, I'm praying ten years from now I'm, when Casey's pushing me around in a wheelchair <laughs> that I can go hear a guy like Lee pastor. He's pastor in a church, mm-hmm. a local yeah. church, and preaching God's word and standing on the word. You know, so absolutely. You know, I mean, to, if you're a Christian and you think that God can't take somebody from <laughs> from that point to God. you know doing whatever He wants to in His kingdom, like you, you just don't know God. Man, yeah, man, one of my yeah. favorites is, is Hannah's prayer, and He says mm-hmm. He raise a beggar from the dunghill mm-hmm. and make him a prince and a god, and that's always been a scripture that's ministered. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I well, mean, it, it's it's such a humbling thing too because, like, we've talked about arrogance a little bit. Yeah, just. You should humble yourself oh. to to like if you kind of sit in the point where you haven't gone down certain paths in life, and you know you you kind of maybe you find that question coming up like wow I can't believe God's using somebody like that or like wow I never thought a person like that would be able to, it's like yeah. you, you might need to you might need to number one repent right <laughs> number two right. you might want to think about the view you have of yourself mm. yeah you know what I mean and yeah. like how lofty of a view you have of sure. yourself. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, it's like, yeah, you should no, number one, you should be exalting, you know, God and the fact yeah. that He's using anybody That's and everybody it. He wants to, and that That's people it. are coming out of it. I mean, right. what is like the whole in Luke? I forget. I, I think it's a quote from Isaiah, but you know, in the early part of Jesus's ministry, it, it talks about that. You know, where it's like He's gonna He's gonna heal the blind, He's gonna yeah. hear the deaf, and He's gonna set the captive free. free. Yes. Yeah. That's it. And so, like, uh, you know, I'm blessed because, um, you know, God's put uh, some pastors in my life that. Uh, has, have spoke to me um and you know recently you know what what we do we sometimes see the worst like mm-hmm. but i i got a different view like um and a different point of view from him because he passes a church that's in a very well-to-do area of town mm-hmm. and he's like fred like when you know I, i'd go to door to door and i'd go to this million dollar house and i knock on the door i had this one guy look at me and say what do i need your jesus for have you looked around 
I've got everything I need. Mm-hmm. And, and when he told me that, man, that I was like, man, I don't know how you deal with that either. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to minister to that, you know? That's rough, man. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a closed off heart right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I think both ends of the spectrum got their own issues, like, oh, sure. and their own way to minister. You know? Sure. So the so the fix, y'all are um, y'all started out of Richmond, y'all yep. were bringing guys, and y'all moved into this house down in King William, yep. which is kind of like a a land based Alcatraz. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like it, if, it's a geographical oddity. It's, yeah. It's 45 minutes from everything. Anything. Everything. So, <laughs> so, so if somebody wanted to run away from it. Yes. It's they're a not, six hour walk. Yeah. They're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Right? They're just going to yeah. get lost in the woods <laughs> yep. somewhere. Circle yep. a cornfield. Come on back. Pick yep. them up. Bring them over to the house. Yeah. That's, that's worth it. a couple try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I meet them on the road. And they yeah. Get, I talk them back in the car. And we, yeah. A good walk does, does wonders. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you have no idea where you're going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, we we are taking guys. Um, here, so we have uh, right now we have like 15 guys in the house, um, two staff, including uh, myself and Pastor Jason, and um, it, it's great. We do. Uh, it's regimented. It's rules. Um, you know, it's funny. Like I, I've had to work through this. Uh, this thing within myself about rules and law and you know grace mm-hmm. and, and like you know I, he's I, a grace guy he don't yeah. like rules no yeah i so don't I'm, think any I'm of us there. like rules but yeah. i'm getting there you know like like somebody said to me you know if somebody asked you about that you would say well how would you keep order in a house with 16 drug addicts yeah <laughs> you know what i mean it's like you gotta have rules you know? all right so tell me all right so i'm coming in yeah i'm i'm been initiated into the program. Okay. Tell me what to expect, right? So I'm a new guy to the program, right? Right. I'm coming to meet you, Fred and Casey, yeah. and you're like, all right, here's what you're getting into. So I think, um, you know, I sit down uh, usually with everybody that comes in the house, and the the first question that I ask is, what are you willing to do to change your life? And I think that really reveals a heart. Um, you know, because some guys will tell you, hey, uh, Fred, I'm willing to do whatever it takes whatever it takes and you'll see that change with 99 percent of the guys as time goes on and yeah. about 90 days <laughs> about 90 days about three right. months in you know yeah. they put on some weight they they've starting to smell good got some fresh clothes on and then all of a sudden uh fred i'm willing to do everything but that um and, and i think that's that that really um is an indicator of whether somebody's going to make it or not. Because, yeah. you know, if you keep that heart of gratitude, um, that's, that's, that's what, that's what keeps a guy. Um, but, but you can expect to wake up at five thirty. Um, we have devotional time in the morning. Breakfast is prepared for the guys. Uh, we, we either do, um, some quiet time, devotional time, or we will do a Bible study. We go through like, have you heard of men's 33? Mm, I don't um, think so. Noble warriors, um, is 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 a biblical look at manhood. So that's like a five part series that lasts a while. We um, do mandatory book studies. Uh, one of them, like just as an instance, is a banquet in the grave, which is a biblical view of addiction. Nice. Um, so they have to go through that. It's twelve chapters, and then we go into another one called Heart of Addiction, which gets a little a little more deeper into idolatry. Um, different author, different author, or same author. Yeah, um, one is uh, Shaw. The other one is Welch. Welch. So, okay, you know, but they co- they correlate, which is really good. Yeah. So, um, you know, and then we go through. Um, you know, I, I like to teach, so I, I'll go line by line through different books, um, and we'll talk about things like stewardship. Um, um, anger is another one. Gossip. We work a lot in James, the book of James. Mm, um, it's a good one. Only because James, I, I think for me, James um, was the, one of the first books I ever read when I was in jail. Mm-hmm. And um, it was clear, it was practical, and I could put it into action. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So them learning that, and then Proverbs, of course, is a big deal. Man, I love Proverbs. Yeah. So. I, I mean, seriously, like, I, I wish that, like, you know, your VBSs, your church camps, and all that sort of other stuff, like, they should mandatory 
or make it mandatory that like people have to memorize proverbs, certain parts of proverbs, yeah. if not the whole thing. Uh, be, I mean, I can't tell you how many times that because I would read a proverb a day for years, yes. you know, so then I'm reading the whole book every month, 12 times a year. You know, I did that for years, right? That something would happen in life and all of a sudden a proverb. Damn. Mm. You could lean on it. Yeah. Just yeah. pop in my head. Right. And I would, and I would know, right. like, don't do that or do that or this right. is the way you should go or whatever. Right. So, you know, like we have guys that come in, um, we have, uh, um, we have a guy from Journey 2 uh, who comes in and teaches on Monday nights. So Journey, people don't know Journey. Yeah. So Journey's a church down here that started um, New Kent. Yep. The first Was the first one down here at the I, food I line? I believe so. That was before my time. Okay. So, you know. So we got the one Journey that's yep. right down here at the food line in yes. New Kent. And then Journey 2. Is in Toanna. There you go. Yeah. So, um, you know, he'll come in and do Bible study on Monday night. Um, before COVID, you know, you were coming in on Wednesdays mm-hmm. teaching. Um, and then we have uh, a guy named Bruce who uh, worked for the IMB for years, comes in on Thursday nights and does a discipleship class with the guys, which is really cool. Um, and then we have a guy named Bruce who does studies on Thursday morning. Clay. Uh, Clay, yeah. And then um, Pastor Angelo is a licensed therapist. He comes in once a week, you know, meets with the guys one-on-one. Um, but the guys, they stay busy. You know, we got partnerships with div- different Christian businesses in the community mm-hmm. that the guys go out, they, they learn a trade. Um, if they do well in the program, they have an opportunity to be hired when they leave. Um, so, you know, it's, it's And then good. they serve Tuesday nights downtown. Town, yeah. Um, we do a Bible study. We do a women's Bible study and a men's Bible study. And some of the guys get to teach sometimes yep. uh-huh. if they're further along in the program. And then we do a service on Sunday night downtown and the guys, like I said, they serve the food, yep. and then um, Set we've up had, right now. yep, and we've had several of the guys who've gotten further along in their walk, who've actually preached down there and done great. Yep. Um, so they have an opportunity to to kind of walk out their calling if they you know if they feel like maybe sure. they're being called to teaching or they're being called to preaching. They have opportunities to actually work that out. So yeah. it's pretty cool. It's really cool. I mean, even to give a testimony. Yeah, you know, because you never know. Like yeah. everybody's testimony is different, right. you know, in some sort of way. So you know, you never know that this one guy's testimony might hit, you know, that guy over there. Yeah. Whereas yeah. y'all's testimony might not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, my heart is for discipleship. So, like, you know, I, you know, a lot of churches uh, becomes very inclusive and try to hold on to everybody. Yeah. You know, I, I, you know, to to send a guy out into the mission field. What I mean by that, he might go. Um, into a vocation or work, but if he gets plugged into a local church, he has a set of discipleship skills that are unique and mm-hmm. like like they came out of the same background that her and I did that can be an asset to a local church, you know. So because was, it's prevalent, yeah. You know, uh, well, al- drug and alcohol is prevalent. So let me, yeah, let yeah. me, let me, let me even touch on that from my perspective, right? Yeah. So people have no idea. You talk about like they don't know what's going on in their own county or city. You know, guys who are in law enforcement, you know, obviously you see a different side of society because yeah. um, of the things you have to deal with. But people have no idea that like drug addiction will go from million dollar homes to the to the person under the and bridge. They just homeless people. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, yeah. the reason why a lot of people got. And this is undeniable, but the reason why a lot of people got addicted on heroin is because they got prescribed all these, you know, pain meds yes. when they had something done to them. And then now all of a sudden they're addicted to those pain meds and they can't get those pain meds anymore. Maybe they are getting them, but just yeah. not in the right yeah. way. Yep. And then before you know it, now they're now they're moving over to heroin and, yes. and other things. Yep. Um, so, yeah, that, I mean, that it's, happens regularly. All the time. All the time. Yeah. The majority people, of the people that yeah, we haven't they, fixed, that's how it happened. Yeah. And then you really? got then you got people. I mean, I might step on toes saying this, but because they go to a doctor and they prescribe oh, yeah. them medication, it's totally fine. They they are completely addicted. Yep. And they're looking at the people that are using the the narcotics off the street, going, "Oh, look at that drug addict." And they got the same exact yeah. problem. Just because they a do. doctor wrote you the prescription doesn't mean you're not addicted. That's right. right. And that's where we see a lot of people yes. that are in denial. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, it's like it's like you know how many, um, you know, even, uh, you know. I mean, I, I'm not one of those guys that just defends cops 
wholesale as if like right, cops right. can never do anything wrong. I mean, there's been plenty of stories of cops who have gotten hurt on the job. Sure. Yeah. So they go to the doctor. Now, you know what I mean? They had to have surgery on their knee, problem. on their arm or something. Now, all of a sudden, they got Percocet or Vicodin yeah. or Oxy, Oxycontin or, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, now they're like, yeah, yeah that's one good. day, you, you just, what happens is you cross this invisible line. Yeah. And once you cross it. You can't go back. You can't get back, you know. And I think, you know, a lot of people um, I watch use, especially um, opiate-based yeah. painkillers. Yeah that are prescribed by a doctor, um, and they abuse them, but they, they they have this denial about them having a, even an issue or problem. Well, because it's in a pill bottle. Right. It's legitimate. And it's right. got their name on it. Yeah. yeah. No, it's really good. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. like, no. Nah. Yeah, the doctor gave me that, Fred. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's like, no. Like, like addiction is, yeah. like, legitimately, yeah. you like, you are dependent on it. You can't stop right. it. Right. You know? You yeah, have give, an, give you me have the pill issue. bottle for 24 hours, and let mm-hmm. me come back and see where you're at. Yeah. <laughs> right? You know, always, I can stop whenever I want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean... I it, can take it or leave it. Yeah. And, and then I'll say, well, yeah. why don't you just leave it then? Yeah, just leave it then. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I want to take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pain's a real thing, though. Yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely like, and that's what people, like, you know, they don't know until they, until, like, they get relief from that pain. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why, like, I... um. I had I got hurt my knee at work last year, last February. So not this past February, the February before. Yeah. Okay. Um, had a guy pull a gun on me, and in in order to get away from it, I slipped and fell on basically the asphalt. Right. You know, hit my knee. Didn't feel it at the time because mm-hmm. obviously my adrenaline's like through the roof. Right. You know, whatever situation's resolved, adrenaline dump, and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh man, my knee's starting to hurt. Yeah. You know, then I was like, oh yeah, I did fall. Well, then the next day it's like swelling up. You know, so I go to the doctor and all this stuff, and, and that was my concern. Yeah. Is I was like, I'm going to see what this doctor says, because if he wants to put me on certain pain meds, like, I might have to pass these off to Chelsea and be like, you're going to regulate these. Yeah. Because Absolutely. You know, like, I'm, I, I don't want to even tempt myself. Right. Above approach. Yeah. Yes. You know, because it's like, you know, any, any cop pretty much knows that right. you're going to you're gonna develop back pain. Yes. And you're going to live with it. Yeah. Because of all the gear you have to wear. Yeah. You know, and it's like in and out of cars, riding in the car, all day. right, sitting in yeah, the car yeah, all day, yeah. all that stuff when your hips. And it's like you start to live with the pain, and then all of a sudden, after like ten years of living in that pain, all of a sudden, you know, you whatever your elbow starts hurting, you go to the doctor, you get you some pain, and then yeah. you're like, oh man, my whole body feels good, right? You know, and then this you're like, good, man, right? I'm ready to work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and so people don't understand like pain's a big thing. Yes, and when you get relief from that pain, it's that's the addiction. Yeah, yeah. and I'm sure in your profession too, like. The, the mental things that y'all go through. Mm-hmm. Um, no different than like, you know, a pastor. Like it, it, what you deal the with. Stress. The stress. PTSD. Yeah. Like um, the constant. And like mm-hmm. I know like from my own experience, you got to be careful because those same drugs will numb your mind too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, and, and like give you this false sense of peace, mm-hmm. you know, and that's just, it's you got to be careful, you know, so... Yeah, I mean, alcohol is a drug, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I can tell you how many cops like just are dependent on alcohol because it's it's legal. Yeah, it's legal. Oh, it's legal, right? So it's yeah. all good. It's yeah. the worst. Don't it's get me terrible. That was me. that was the worst for me. Yeah, I mean, that, I got more trouble on alcohol than I did heroin. I had a guy, uh, I had a cop. <laughs> yep. Tell me this one time. He said, "You know, this is you know this is like a couple years ago, and I know Virginia's moved to a point where basically uh, marijuana is decriminalized, mm-hmm. right? It's not legal yet, right? Mm-hmm. Probably will be pretty soon, but it's decriminalized. So There's a yeah. civil penalty um, for just simple possession, yeah, right? But this was a couple years ago, and it's still a class one misdemeanor. Um, and he was like, you know, I'd never been to a domestic where the people were high on weed, yeah, right. but I have been to countless where they're oh. drunk. Probably uncountable. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it's, it's a valid point, you yeah. know. And now yeah. he, he he was not arguing, right? He was to, to legalize marijuana. Yeah. He was just making a statement. He was just like, you know, if you really think about it, yeah, you know, we we, we have the same point. We got, got this got thing called point. alcohol, but because it's legal, it's all good. Yeah. Yes, but then weed is all of a sudden now this like horrendous thing. Right. So so go back to like people in the church, right? Right. How many people in the church drink? How many people in the church probably get drunk? Yes. Oh, I'm in my home or what, you know, yeah. I'll have the glass of wine with dinner. No, you yeah. don't. You drink four Budweiser's, you know, like, yeah. so you got that, but because yeah. it's not out there, you know, like yeah. you're not, you're not on YouTube about it or whatever. You didn't get arrested right. for it because it's not illegal to get drunk in your house unless you do something stupid. Right. Yeah. But, but then, but then 
But then that 18 year old who comes to youth group who you know smells like weed, right? You almost think he's unsavable, right? Yeah, well, I, I think it's going to be hard, and this is something that's dear to my heart because mm-hmm. I think um, in a lot of churches there is a culture of drinking. Oh yeah, and, and it's okay. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I've seen uh, people uh, post pictures of them at the brewery mm-hmm. partying with friends and, and certain pastors that condone that behavior. And like it, it I like you got to understand like where I come from and what I see, I see alcohol who, that devastates and ravishes families. Yep. And I, my family's one of them, yeah. you know, and I've seen the horrors that come from it. Um, and I think if you take a very uh, honest look, like, at even Christian families, there's not a family that has not been touched by alcohol. Absolutely. Yeah. So for me, like I'm a, t- I have to be a teetotaler in that. Now mm-hmm. I'm not saying that drinking's a sin. Yeah. Um. But but there's a line, and why do we want to tiptoe on that line? And then once you condone that type of behavior, when it does legalize marijuana, how do you differ- differentiate between how do you? the two? How you do know? you? And then maybe one day they make something else legal. Yeah. I don't see if you don't draw a line there, mm-hmm. you know, compromise, well, little compromise. Christians have to understand our morality is not based on what the legality is of yes, that's it. whatever that's society we live in. Yes. You yes. know, I mean, yep. abortion is legal. Yeah. yeah. Right. But right. if you're a Christian, you cannot support abortion. Right. There is no other stance it's on that. Not even, you know, yeah. There's right. no other Christian stance on that. And like I look at, I look at through uh, like stories in the Old Testament where alcohol is involved and it never turns out well. It's always bad. <laughs> It's mm-hmm. always bad. Yeah. Like a lot. And, I mean, it's just. And I'm sure somebody, I'm sure somebody might be listening to the sections be like, well, Jesus turned yeah. water into wine. And yeah. it's like, okay, well, first of all, go study. Yeah. All right. It doesn't yeah. say it was alcoholic. Right. Okay. And second of all, there's plenty of other reasons yeah. to, to. Jesus didn't not, drink. I don't say, it didn't say yeah. Jesus drank it. And, yeah. Like, and then like you look at um, um, uh, David and Bathsheba, like he used alcohol in that yeah. whole story. You know what I mean? It's like Noah got drunk after the ark, and then yeah. look what happened with his kids. Yeah, it's just go it's back a to Proverbs. Issue. I think yeah. it's Proverbs twenty five. Pro- somewhere in Proverbs, yeah. yeah, where it talks about you know being a drunkard right. and and um, it's yeah. yeah. And I go back to Lot. I always go back to Lot, oh, his yeah. wife, and all that because I mean, like a man who can uh, drink without impunity, mm-hmm. like our father at the table, it doesn't affect him. It doesn't have any consequences. But he's got a small son or a daughter that watches him do that day after day after day. Yep. I ha- I can't, like, this guy might not ever struggle with alcohol, but the little sister, my daughter, might grow up. To be an alcoholic. It might be a raging alcoholic. So, so like, I w- I w- I'm not going to take that chance. Like Chelsea and I have talked about this, and, and we're, we're the same way, right? Yeah. Like, we're like, look. If you're a Christian and you drink, we're not going to sit here and condemn you. We're not yes. going to say you're living a life of sin. That's yes. not, but we're we don't drink. Yeah. yeah. And and you know she's agreed with me on that. And and you know we take the same exact stance. We're on the same exact page with it. Right. The the risk far outweigh any yeah. quote the benefit. reward. The benefit. I, I don't even reward's right. not even a good word for it. Right. But but I, I again. Right. So you, you brought up a perfect example. I can't tell you how many Christ, strong Christian couples. Yes. I have seen. Do that exact thing, right? Yep. They're the ones who are in the church teaching the Sunday school, might be an elder in the church, yep. you know, a preacher, whatever. All I mean, they are solid. They know the Bible. They love people, yeah. blah, 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 but they have their drinks. Yes. All of a sudden, look at their kids when the kids turn 16, 17, yeah. 18, 20 years old. Yeah, they, and those kids are now not. Why? Because, well, because they love that joy of alcohol more than right. they love following after Christ. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you, you take away your witness with your children, too, because, like, you know, I have a, a, a parents come to me and say, "My son's a junkie. He's this and that," um, but they're, they're they're drinking, and like you, you, you take away any like because I know the kid. I was a kid one time. Well, hey, man, what do you man. mean? Like, what do you it's mean? Hypocritical. Yeah, it's you're hypocritical. Yeah, you're a hypocrite. Dad. How are you going to tell yeah. me I can't smoke weed right. when you have four beers for dinner? Yeah, one of those types yeah. of things. So I, I think it's you got to weigh, like you said. I just don't out. see. I just don't see a benefit to it. No. Yeah, I mean, some people are like, "Oh, I enjoy it," or whatever makes you feel good. There's that, and I'm just like, "How many, how many negatives can we can we list off?" Yeah. You know, and is it like you said? You have to think about so many more things. It's not just about you. It's That's about your it. kids. Maybe it's about your, spo- your it's spouse. Your spouse. Yeah. Right. It's you about your witness to to not only 
other people in the church. You know, maybe people who are coming out of addictions and stuff right. like that. But but what about um, people who aren't Christians who view you? Right. Yeah. You know, like at the end of the day, Paul said that he would give up meat. Yeah. If it causes his brother to stumble. And I'm not saying like, I'm not trying to apply that. Like if somebody thinks something is wrong, you're not allowed to do it. That's right. not what that passage is talking about. Right. But what I am saying is if your witness is hurt by something that you're doing right. and it's a freedom, let's yes. just classify it as a freedom, a freedom, right? right? Like we're not saying, oh, your witness is hurt because right. you, you you said online that abortion's evil. Right. right. Well, well, too bad. You know, you're going to have to take a stance on that. But yeah. if, if your witness is hurt because you wear the color blue, then don't ever wear the color blue again. Right. Mm -hmm. That's it. I I think anything for me that hinders the advancement of God's, the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be removed. Yeah. And like, like I had this, this conversation about like the statues in Richmond. Yeah. If that statue gets in the way of me advancing God's, the gospel, Mm -hmm. I tear it down, get rid of it. You know what I mean? If somebody's not going to hear what I'm saying about the gospel of Jesus Christ because of that statue, Let's just take it down. A lot of Christians, you, you know. <laughs> a lot of Christians are um, very, very caught up in the drama right now. Yes. So I did a podcast recently. Yeah. And essentially, it was it was politics, Christians, and social media. Yeah. That's that's kind of what it is. We watched it. We watched. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, so that was one of the three people. No, I'm just kidding. I got to look at one and three. Um, but no, I mean the, the whole concept behind that podcast yeah. is essentially like, look, it's very volatile right now. Right. And you need to pick and choose your battles. Yes. Right? And if, if somebody who's not a Christian, all they see on your social media is why this political person is the best and, yeah. and that other political person is an idiot. And anybody yeah. who believes that political person is an idiot. Right. Well, those people who believe that political person need Jesus as much as the people who yeah. believe your political party need Jesus. That's so it. now you've just eliminated half the people you could witness to doesn't mean you can't have political stances. Yep. doesn't mean some things in politics aren't worth talking about. Sure they are, right? right. Politics and Christianity definitely overlap. Yes. Uh, there's, there's not a, it's not a separation here where they don't overlap at all. But at the same time, you know, your persona of social media, you know, needs to be one that is, is very careful Yes. Not to isolate an entire segment of society right. on really tertiary issues. Right. You know, like what's your what's your stance on on the monuments? What's your stance right. on wh- whether you should wear a mask or not? How do you feel about coronavirus? I mean, I want to talk about Jesus. Yeah. Amen. You know, yeah. it's it's like you know people. Right. It's like in the podcast I talked about that, right? You know, people want to talk about justice for this person, justice for that person. Okay, cool. Let's talk about justice. Yeah. Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Yeah. The God of justice. What he did to bring us justice, to take God's justice away from us so right. we don't have to... You know, that's the conversation Christians need to have. That's it. And, and, and like, um, the simplicity of, of the gospel for me is um, God's, God's just. And he... It, it, I deserve... Death. Death. Mm-hmm. Me. You know, how can I, until I self-examine, look at somebody else and say they deserve justice? When I when I deserve the same thing, like yeah. and, and like at the end of the day, it's so simple. Like, like all the learning and all the reading and all the books that I read, if I can sum it up, that I'm I'm a rank center, and I'm in need of a savior. Mm-hmm. Before I I point at you and tell you tell you you need that. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. So, I just I, I think the thing, and I mean I'm sure that there's people if they're out there listening or like ranting and railing against me right now, but yeah, um, you know to me it's just more of like look. You got to be able to pick your your conversations because right. things are so polarized in our culture, right. you know. And so, if I'm going to be polarized for something, I want to be polarized for Christ. Amen. That's it. I, I don't want to be polarized because of a certain person I voted for, you know, because I think that everything they do is right and everything right. the other people do are wrong, wrong, or you know, like any of those things. Like, yeah. yeah, I have a stance on abortion. Yeah, that's a political issue. I have no problem voicing that. Right. You know, because that's that's a that's a moral Christian kind of standing yeah, on something. That's it. You know, it's a morality. It's a moral gospel. Like, yeah, absolutely. So, like, that's where the politics for me, the politics and Christianity do overlap in a sense. Yeah. But, but I just see so many Christians online. Basically, they they it, it, here's a here's the thing I, I look at right because I have a lot of uh, friends who are you would say liberal politically. Yes. Okay. And I. 
I almost wonder, like, if I put myself in their shoes, yeah, like, why would they give a Christian a time of day? Yeah, because basically all they hear from that Christian is, "Well, you're an idiot. Yep. You're stupid. Yep. Like, how dare you? Yeah. You know, even think like I can't even I can't even understand why you would think that. You're so dumb. Right. You know, I, I can't believe you would vote for that person. You can't even be a human to vote for that person. Right. And it's just like, what if somebody was saying that about me? Yeah. What if somebody was, you know, looking at me and basically like, you're an idiot, but, and then trying to convince me of their opinion. Well, I'm not going to listen to you. Right. right. So I just think Christians need to be very careful. Well, I think that's, you've that. got to be careful because that hinders the gospel. Well, it, it, I keep thinking about the scripture, be wise as a serpent and mm-hmm. harmless as a dove. Yeah. Like we have to be wise and we have to pick, we can't die on every hill. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like in our ministry, we would deal with a lot of lost people. And, and you have to put Jesus first. And sometimes, a lot of times, you hear a lot of things that you don't agree with. Oh, yeah. But you just kind of, let's, yeah. let's filter it to Jesus. How can I make this conversation go from this to Jesus? Right. How Absolutely. can I make this a gospel conversation right. yep. and turn it that way? And see, the gospel's offensive. Yeah. Absolutely. We don't have to be offensive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We should, we should be, um, I mean, live peaceably among all men as much as it depends, depends on, on me. You know, and I think, again, like when I preach the truth of God's word, that offends people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got to, I, I have to somehow, some way find it in me to love people that are different than me. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And then, then in that way, um, preach God's word to them. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, like you said, I mean, I, I could only imagine, actually, I don't have to because I have similar conversations, but <laughs> probably not as frequently as right. y'all do, but conversations of people where, you don't have to nitpick every single little thing that they say that's different because if 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 you can get somebody to understand who Jesus is and accept the gospel, you have a whole foundation now to start with. Yes. yes. A lot of stuff that they have already now acknowledged, yeah. I'm going to agree to these things. Mm-hmm. Right. They might not know all the implications of those things. Right. But they know, like, I, I've made the commitment to to accept this. Right. Now, now help me to learn what all that means. Yeah. Right. But it's almost like you're you're arguing with people who don't have that same foundational worldview, right? And you're confused as to why they don't agree with you. Yeah. Well, of course they don't, because yeah, they have a different worldview. Yeah, right. well, you got to seek to understand. Like, yep. like I I know personally pastors that I believe to be men of God that don't stand in the same place I do. Mm-hmm. They're 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 liberal. Mm-hmm. They're going to vote liberal. So instead of like calling them out and pointing fingers and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, I want, I want to sit down and have an intelligent conversation because if I believe he's a man of God, yeah. he's got reasons why he thinks the way he does, and I want to seek to understand that. Yeah, and how arrogant is it of us to to immediately assume we're right about everything? Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's like that's one of the things that I've really come around to is like just because – you may be very confident that the gospel is correct. Yes. Does not mean that then you ha- should have the same level of confidence on every issue in life. Right. Yes. Yes. And, and I think it's, it's, it's so important. Like, like I've heard, like I, I, I have gotten now caught up in the different gospels that are preached that mm-hmm. aren't the gospel. They may sound like the gospel. They may be, it's narcissistic gospel. There's there's the mor- moral gospel. There's so many different gospels that health that are gospel. preached, and like if you don't buy that brand of Christianity, you're wrong. Mm-hmm. And there's only one. You know what I mean? It's the scriptures, and then we'll put our opinions and what we think, and I, it's just it's it's hard. It's hard for me to. Um, understand why we can't sit down at a table and have an intelligent conversation and it's okay to disagree sure yeah and still be friends right you know what i'm saying and i think we've had that conversation with you all before is that do we agree on the main things you know can we agree that jesus is lord can we agree on on the things that matter everything else we can talk about right sure we you know we agree on these things yeah and and and, you know i think too like (laughs) When you when you get further along in your Christianity, and especially if you don't restrict yourself to to just being in your little, and I would even within the larger Christian realm, right. your camp of Christians who already agree with your style of Christianity. Yes, yeah. if you actually broaden yourself out, right? 
one thing that you will learn is that your list, at least I hope you learn, is that your list of what is actually essential <laughs> should shrink. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and see, especially in our ministry, because like, like people get caught up on certain things, but like at the end of the day, uh, for her and I, it's our ministry is about life and death. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we, I like I can get so arrogant and prideful about what I believe to be biblical. Mm-hmm. That I refuse to send a guy because I don't have room to another program that maybe has a slight variation in the doctrine. Yeah, but they're still preaching the gospel. But I won't take a, a heroin addict and send him there because I don't agree, mm-hmm. and that's wrong. And we don't have that luxury in this ministry right. because that same guy might be dead next week. Yeah, that's what's crazy, right? So uh, it's such a good point. You know, when you get into uh, let's say higher education of Christianity. Yeah. It's very easy to get stuck in, in talking about things in a academic setting yeah. and forgetting that when you really get down in the trenches of ministry, yeah. like you've already said, it's like, what's your stance on women preachers, for example, yeah. right? Right. Okay, well, right now I don't care because right. this guy is detoxing. Yes. yes. You know, like this right. guy is literally struggling yes. for his life. Right. right. He almost OD'd tonight. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, like we need to get him to the point where he can understand he and needs Jesus. And if he Jesus. receives Jesus through me, through him, through anybody, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's just the point is he needs to know Jesus. Right. Yeah. But does he know Jesus? Like I have a firm stance on what I think about women preachers. Right. Yeah. Right, but, but see, again, but again, but for for me, um, I think the awakening came for me was listening to that guy Jeff Durbin. Mm. So somebody came to him and he was in front of a a um, um, an abortion clinic. Mm-hmm. A non-believer, you know, was like, well, you know, he was laying out this adoption model, and he said, the the person said to him, I think it was something like this, and I'm not quoting it verbatim. Said like, well, you wouldn't allow a baby to be adopted um, into a same sex marriage. And he said, you're wrong, because that child's life comes before anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and he said, like, the Holy Spirit can work through that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, I have a firm belief on women pastors, too. Um, but at the same time, a person's life is the most important thing, because yeah. I know where there's life, there's hope. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and, and look, I, I've, I've gotten involved with people that have different doctrine than me. You keep preaching God's word and keep preaching the truth and standing on it, people people will come around. The to spirit that. will mm-hmm. move. The yeah. spirit changes the heart, not right. us. Yeah. Just like, and it goes back to the arguments that you have on Facebook. I'm not going to change anybody's stance, whether they're a Christian or not. Only the Holy Spirit. I can plant. God. Somebody can water, mm-hmm. but God gives the increase. Yeah. And so, you know, my arguing and my. You know, beating a dead horse is not going to change anybody's mind. Especially, especially the venue of social media. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that, um, <clears throat> like, if you really look at it, social media is still pretty much in its infant stage mm-hmm. yeah. as far as like uh, culturally. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it's still relatively new. Yeah, and it keeps changing. You know, like Facebook used to be the big thing, and then, <laughs> yeah. and then, and then Twitter, Instagram. and then Twitter was yeah. it, and then Instagram. Snapchat oh. came out. Instagram. Instagram. Now everybody's on TikTok. It's like yeah. I look at it now, and it's like most. Kids aren't even on Facebook. Mm-mm. You know, it, it's like all the parents who came to like stalk them stayed when all yeah. the kids left because yeah. their parents came to stalk them. Right. And, and now they got sucked yeah. in and they have and an addiction. It, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> like my, and like my conviction, like like with social media, is I try to use that as a platform to further the gospel, like this, right? Yeah, you know. But at the same time, n- nothing works like one on one. Nothing. You know, I could share scriptures all day on Facebook. Yep. Is it really reaching? Yep. Well, and that, you know what I mean? So, so it goes back to the whole like political thing, right? Yeah. If, like, if you're just sitting there on social media, if you're just throwing out a bunch of political posts, political posts, political posts, it's like, when are you ever sitting down with somebody who disagrees with you on that sort of thing? Duncan's making a guest appearance. <laughs> Duncan. <laughs> so anybody who doesn't yeah. know, this is my dog named Duncan. He wanted to be a guest on this uh, episode. Yeah. So thanks for joining us, Duncan. But anyways, like, you know, people, you need to sit down. You need to sit down, you know, and, and actually have a one-on-one conversation. So because That's people it. can't feel your heart, right? People can't feel your, you know, your love and, you, yeah. and your desire to actually care for them as a person. Yeah. Over social media. That's it. Text, it's not there. Email or any of that sort of thing. It's not there. No, it's and, not there at all. And like it, it, it's seen. This is this is what I see with social media. People use it as, also as a platform to strike back mm. or. Or oh, be yeah. aggressive and, and like passive aggressive. And instead of Worse. sitting down with it. the person, <laughs> yep. 
right? Because most people can't have a one-on-one confrontation with somebody. They're scared of it. it incredibly. You, you know what I mean? And, like, for me, like, when I can sit across the table from a guy like Billy Dyer and we can have it out, and then um, afterwards hug it out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's That's okay. Your that's de- maturity. Your, your attitude and demeanor are different. Yeah. When you are face to face with somebody, yes, and, and I think that there's a there's an element of um, kind of like that, not fear, like right. oh, this person's going to beat me up, right? But you don't have to like at yeah. the at the end of the day, like you know, we are we are wild creatures, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, you know, and so, yeah. and so like you can sit behind a computer screen, yeah, and just rail on somebody, mm-hmm. call them all sorts, of, but you never do it to their face, no, no, because no. because something back there. You know, in our little in our little animal brain, right, might be firing, going, "Hey, you need to like preserve life, yeah, yeah. your life, right. yeah." <laughs> you know, because yeah. if you if you say yeah. something too bad to this guy, he yeah. might actually punch you in the face. And like that, you know, I see that too. Like, um, even even in the pulpit, like yep. we we'll get passive aggressive in the pulpit about somebody, but won't confront them. Mm-hmm. We'll mm-hmm. preach we'll preach a whole series about them. Mm-hmm. Instead of just sitting down with the person and just hammering the thing out, yeah, yeah. And, and I think um, you know that that's not a healthy way to do things. It's like, an abuse, really. Right? If you think about it, I had a um, yeah. college professor. You know, he he mentioned that. You know, right. he said, you know, it's it's really easy because you know, obviously, he was strong doctrinally. He's talking yeah. about all this stuff, and he's like, look, you know, one thing is you get you young people have to realize you're going into ministry, yeah. right? When you deal with people, you're dealing with people. Yeah, here. We're dealing with ideas. Yeah. It's easy to be highly critical and attacking of an idea. Mm-hmm. But when you're dealing with a person, you can't have that same, you know, kind of like yeah. brunt force. Yeah. Because you're dealing with a, a person, a human being. Yeah. And it was, it just stuck with me, you know, because like you said, it's like, all right, look, if I want to get, if I want to get in the pulpit and preach a message on like whatever, right. you know, abortion. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to preach a message, but then I'm not going to like sit across the table from somebody who is either thinking about having one or who has had one. Yeah. And basically like hit them as hard. Right. You know, or be as blunt about yeah. it. I mean, I've even like, I, I knew people at, at the church in Maryland who people who went to the church who had abortions in the past and had repented. Yeah. So anytime I would have to preach from it, not have to, but every time I preached about it from the pulpit, yeah. I always kept that in mind. Like, you know, this is going to be hard for them. You know, and so I'd always try to like, give them a call beforehand, like, "Hey, you know, this Sunday I'm going to be preaching on this message." So, like, I know your stance on it. Yep. I know you don't agree with it. I know you. Re- I know, but if if you don't want to be there this Sunday, if you want to go serve in the children's ministry, or if you get up yeah. and walk out, like, I, I understand. Oh, yeah. You know, sort of thing. I want you to know, right? That I like I accept your repentance. You know, as if yeah. it's me. But right. you know, kind of like I'm not preaching at you, right? Specifically, yeah. This is not condemnation. Yes, right. right. Exactly. Yeah. And I would throw that in on the sermons too, like, hey, you know, if yeah. you've had one, whatever. But whatever it is, right? Is I, it, well, I think in our hurts, even as pastors, like if people hurt us personally, or yeah. somebody does something we don't agree with, and we start to preach about it from the pulpit, mm-hmm. we're not really preaching the gospel at that yeah. point. You know what I'm saying? We're not preaching for men's souls. We're not preaching. Um, to reach the lost, um, you, you, we're preaching, um, and it's emotional driven, and it's our own emotions. It's our preferences. Yes, we're well, preaching I think our it preferences. comes back to the fact that we, as humans, are we we shrink back from healthy confrontation, confrontation. and there's a way to do it biblically. Yes, that's mm-hmm. healthy. <laughs> But we have to overcome that fear. We have to fear the Lord more than we fear this person. Your whole, we have you, to do it biblically. Your whole ministry is confrontation absolutely <laughs> and, I, and i don't just mean that yeah, like yeah. in general like it I mean, used to be right. non-confrontation yeah like anybody who's in ministry yeah. like yeah it's a it's a ministry of confrontation but oh, the yeah. fix yes yeah. yeah like you're literally bringing people onto the hot seat and going do you not see that the, what you're doing is leading to yes. death right. it's just that it's a lot more like um immediate for those guys yes but everybody who's in sin yeah it's, it should be the same sort of yeah, confrontation right. that, you know... The that wages of sin is death. Is death. Mm-hmm. You know? And, yeah. Um, I, I think that it's an urgency to all sin. But you guys have to do it, like like you said, you have to get uncomfortable yeah. with the confrontation of, of, like, yeah. sitting down with guys and yes. saying, like, you can't do this. Right. And, and, you know? and I've had to learn, too, because um, I can I can confront the guys in a, uh, a completely different manner than I've realized that I can confront people in the church. mm and that that's a shame, 
You know, yeah. but I can be straight up raw and real with a guy at the fix. Mm-hmm. And he'll accept it. And he will accept he'll that. He'll receive it. But then you sit down with somebody in the church and say, hey, man, this is what's going on. You know, we need to address this. And they're like, I can't believe you would talk to me that way. Or, you yeah, know what, what do you, I mean? What do you think that's, <laughs> it's like think that's, like, yeah. what do you think that's from? Why do you think that, that there's a um, difference there? I, I think that uh, for... Uh, guys that are coming off the street, and, and I will include women in this because we're, you know, we're working on a women's program. Um, I, I think the the wall of denial um, for a drug addict, um, the way that you pierce that um, is with just straight up truth. Mm-hmm. Whereas also the guys in some of the genres they've been through, like prison or homelessness. Um, they would rather you just be completely straight up with them, yeah, um, and upfront where you know where they stand, and that you know where they stand with me. I know where they stand, and they know where I stand. Then, then just tiptoe and try to not coddle and hurt feelings. Does that make sense? But I also think there's the level of humility in the yeah. program that there isn't in the church. Yes. Because the guys in the program, they understand, like you said earlier, they have a problem. They understand that they need help. They're there to get help. Right. Um, so there is a level of humility to say, I know that I'm wrong. Please help me. Show me the way. Right. Whereas in the church, we have this, I got this mentality right. and yeah. I'm good. Don't call me out on my, you know, I'll hold you accountable. Don't hold me accountable. Yeah. Right. Type thing. Well, it's almost one of those where like, Let's say you got some guy who is um, coming out of an addiction, right? Uh, he's seen the fruition yes. of his actions and his yes. choices. Yes. yes. Whereas some guy who, let's say, is like a, a workaholic, yeah, he's not going to see that until he's 16, his kids are grown, mm-hmm. and he yeah. has no relationship. Or a guy who's, a, you know, like we say a drunk, but maybe he doesn't get arrested, he doesn't get the DUI. Yeah, but he doesn't a, have any consequences. Yeah, it, really. yeah, but it's not until he gets a divorce from his wife because she's just done dealing with it after 15 years. Yeah. You know, or you know the 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 couple that just they're so caught up in the distractions of like oh, I need my kids in this in this club and I need them to be in this sporting event right. and I got to take them here and you the whole time you're like you, you realize you got to get them in the church right like now they're six now they're ten now they're fi- oh now, now they're, they're stray s- now they're seventeen and they're pregnant yeah you know now they're eighteen and they went to college and they could care less about Jesus right hmm I wonder where that or came about the fix now oh <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Oh, yeah. full yeah. circle. Yeah. No, I mean, but seriously, like you said, it's 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 a humility factor. Yes. Mm-hmm. But you know, the the Bible actually teaches us that we need to open ourselves up, not to everybody in the church. It's not a matter right. of like everybody needs to go in front of the church and go, "Here's my sin." Yeah. You know, um, n- not even in your small group or whatever right. you do. Like, I want all these people in my small group. You know, but you need to have somebody. Yes. In your life, who's another Christian influence who yes. you can open up about those yeah. things right. to. Yeah, to you can share iron sharpens iron, iron, right? Yeah. One man sharpens another. Yeah. yeah. And how many of us are walking around as like a nobody there? No. Nobody there to help us. No, and I think it's bad for, uh, as men of God and leadership that, that has no accountability or nobody to go to. Yeah. To hold them accountable. Yeah. I, I think that um, in my walk and as far as God has... Uh, allowed me to go in my walk with Christ is because I have always um, allowed people into my life and mm-hmm. it's been straight up about what I'm dealing with, what I'm going through. Um, I think that's key. Even for um, a a man who would say um, um, he's a new creation, um, had been delivered from drugs and alcohol, um, I, it's still that that's there. And you always got to have somebody, whether it be your wife, can look at you in the face and say, Fred, you're being a junkie right now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? That I see that behavior. That's key. Yeah. You know, and be able to receive that. Mm-hmm. It's humility. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the longer I walk with Christ, the more I recognize that really the core foundational um, quality a Christian needs is humility. Yeah. Like everything else flows from that. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's why the Bible talks about pride in such a negative manner. It's the opposite of humility. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? I mean, if you're prideful, you're not going to be open to correction. You're not going to want to grow. You're going to think too lofty of yourself. You're going to look down yeah. on other people. You're going to judge other people. I mean, everything flows yeah. from it. From the beginning, you'll be like God. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. So. You know. Yeah. So what do you, I mean, you know, I, I think the, um, the good aspect here to look at, you know, we yeah. talked a lot about this, like the social media, what you guys are doing, like, you know, keeping yeah. your mind, you know, the main things on the main things is like, 
I, I really think that through all this, you know, the coronavirus, all the crazy stuff that's happening in our culture and everything, yeah. and like Christians getting all in upheaval. Yeah. I think I think Christians really need to take a step back, have a, a, a moment of reflection. Mm-hmm. Like, why are they so bent out of shape right now as to what's going on? You know, and, and, and harness the frustration, leave the anxiousness mm-hmm. at the foot of the cross, yes. you know, because the Bible tells us to do that rather than lashing out on social media yeah. and, and use it as a catalyst to get into people's lives right. And, right. and have those conversations, have that uncomfortable confrontation or whatever yeah. it is, or start to do ministry on the streets yes. rather than, you know, this pseudo ministry that you call just on social media, which right. is not a ministry. It's right. just you lashing out in anger at people who you disagree with. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I just, here, here's a question I have. Yep. Have you ever seen somebody convert it to Christ off of a meme? <laughs> no. And, and I think we live in a culture <laughs> of um, meme Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. Like everybody's got these really cool three word, you yeah, know, little one sentence meme. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, it sounds like really spiritual, and you know, but I, I think that um, we, it's surface level mm-hmm. Christianity that we deal with today. It's our carnal Christianity that we deal with today. There's no depth. There's no weight. There's no roots in the gospel. There's no roots in God's word. Um, to me, it comes across as as um, a lack of care yes. for somebody else as a human being. Yeah. You know, and I and I say that as one who is like completely guilty right. of of yeah, right. in the recent past right. being that sort of guy. Yeah, you know, and, and I'm it, convicted right now. Yeah, <laughs> you know I, what I mean. I mean, I would say I would say even within the past year, you know, just yeah. how much my mindset has changed yeah. on what I do on social media because right. it's like it's not beneficial. It's it's mostly harmful. Yeah, and unless it's you're wi- yeah, it really is. Yeah. You know, and unless you're willing to actually sit down with people and talk to them and have the humble attitude that you might actually learn something. Mm-hmm. See, I believe that the when the heart closes off is the end of Christian discipleship. Yeah. When you close your heart off to learn more and more, mm. even from people. Yeah. Other men of God that might not agree with you. Sure. That's the end of the discipleship. Yeah. You know, so but I but I do I think it's a, a very detached way for us to share our faith. I like that. I, I I think that's such a good way to put it. Right. There's no there's no no skin in the game. Yeah, you could just drop it and leave. Yeah. To right? where it takes pain, it takes hurt, it takes it takes a lot to get into a person's life and start to disciple them. I was having a conversation with a um preacher buddy of mine yeah. and uh he was telling me about, you know, his church and was saying that he's actually recently over this past year had a, a couple, a, a right. lesbian couple, come into his church. Yeah. And they were coming for a while. Great, right? Like, yep. if your church doesn't welcome people of all sinful backgrounds who are still in their sins, I'm not. We're not talking about people who claim Christ. Yeah, right. We're talking about people who just come to visit your church. Come yeah. on, right? Yes, yes. You should be welcome. Absolutely. Okay. Now they come and then and then they approach him. And they want to place a membership. Yeah. That's when the confrontation. That's when the uncomfortable confrontation of okay, listen. Yeah. You know, we love that you guys are here. Yes. Totally come every Sunday. Right. No problem, right. you know. But if you're going to want to be members, you know, you have to be Christians. Yeah. And if you're going to be Christians, you have to accept that this lifestyle right. is sinful. Now, yes. we're not going to get into, like, uh, like right now on this podcast, like, I'm mm-hmm. not going to get into all the ins and outs of logistics of, right, like, right. people what that who looks are, like. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, that, there's actually a really good book. If anybody's listening and want to go listen to it, it's um, Gay Girl, Good God. Yes. Jackie Hill Perry. Yeah. Fantastic. She's Loved a it. phenomenal teacher, too. Loved it. I listened to the book, and I told yeah. Chelsea, I was like, I want to listen to it Blown again. Away. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, the away. whole time I was sitting there driving in my car, right. listening to this thing, like, I think I listened to it in like two days. So, look, I, 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 I was like, I want to listen to it again. I like, this was so spot on. But anyway, so they have this conversation, and he said, you know, I was, I was in the room weeping, mm. and they were weeping. Yeah. Because we had built a relationship. Yes. Where I loved them, and yeah. they had an affection towards me. You know, like, like mm-hmm. a human affection. Yes. Yeah. And they realized there's this barrier, and they're not willing to give that lifestyle up. Right. Right. And we realize that we have to stand right. with Christ above them, and that hurts sometimes. Yes. Yeah. But guess what? Those, that couple still comes. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, that's amazing. Right. 
that you know that that no, that mean, sort of relationship that's ministry. Yeah, you know, it is. You know, and dropping a meme on social media. <laughs> well, I tell you, you're never you, know, you, get talk, there. you talk about that. One of the most uh, profound days that I ever had was at a conference, and um, this uh, lady got up and shared her testimony in front of a whole room of pastors. Mm-hmm. So it was amazing, and she helped start the LGB. Q movement mm-hmm. in the, I guess in the 70s or 80s she was militant and um, she was she's a she wrote books on on it um, and she got invited to a pastor's house and um, the wife and she went armed to get information about to put in her book about how yeah you know Christians or this and that. And she said that she was fully expecting to have the conversation at dinner time. And the conversation never happened. They ate, they talked about life. She left. That continued over a period of years until one day she was broken and found herself sitting in the front pew of this man's church. Hmm. And, and the, the testimony that came out of that, other hmm. than these people loving her for just where she was. Mm-hmm. And not trying to, you yeah. know, beat condemn her, her yeah. or beat her up or just continue to share God's word. Because God's word changes people's hearts, yeah. not yeah. my opinion yeah. or, or what I like or don't like. Well, so. it's, it's funny that we talk about this because we had um, a guy that comes downtown to our um, homeless ministry. And we did a Who's Your One. I don't know if you've heard of it. And, and you really just yeah. pray every yeah. one. Mm-hmm. Yep. And God kept laying him on my heart. And I was like, no, Man. he's not the one. He's too hard. And I was convicted then yeah. that, you know, God can do anything. And um, I talked to one of my mentors, um, Donna, and, and I said, how do I minister to this person who is obviously homosexual and she said well how do you minister to the drug addicts that come down there <laughs> yeah. how do you minister to the alcoholics yeah. that come right. down? how do you minister to the women who gossip and and i was really convicted i'm like i just need to love him and i need to pray for him yep. and let yep. god do the rest and share yep. the gospel and you know right so yeah it's almost like sometimes we um again it goes back to like that christian bubble yeah. you know yeah. you get caught in a christian bubble and and i mean we all do like i've been yeah. guilty of it too you know and and you start to almost look at certain people certain people yeah as if like they're aliens, yeah. right? Right. You know, like they're not people. They're, they're it's like a, yeah, it's like it's like dehumanize, dehumanize them, right? Yeah. Yes. It's like they're a different. It's like a different animal. It's right. a different species. They're not yeah. human. And, and you don't say that. You don't mean that. Yeah. Right. But uh, you treat people like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it's sin. Yeah, sin is sin. That's uh, sin. that goes back to it, right? It's sin nature. Sin the drug addict, the, the alcoholic, Bible. the liar, the gossip, yeah. the homosexual. It's yeah. all yeah. sin. Yeah. The idolatry, all of it. Yeah. So. And, and and we all have we all have this specific thing in our own life, right? Absolutely. You know, we get that log that's sticking out of our own eye, but we love to talk about the speck in somebody else's. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's funny to me because uh, I mean, I again, I, I'm gonna step on some toes. It's funny because we'll hear, I, I can't believe that you would take your kids out there to the fix, like there's yeah. drug addicts there, and like you you take your kids to a church where the pastor looks at porn every day. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it blows me away. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. What people think in their minds, these mm-hmm. stereotypes that we, that we, we come up with, you know? You don't think that there's some guy who's like a um, child molester who might go to a church? Right. That you don't know nothing about. Yeah. No idea. No idea. Right. But that, because that guy smoked crack, you know, yeah. a year ago. I mean, this ago. guy's in a suit though, so I mean, clearly he's good. Clearly he's, he's good. good. Clearly he's, he's good. Sanctified. You know what I mean? He's sanctified. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. I mean, he drives a BMW, so yeah. I mean, clearly, Justified. clearly he's good. So, you know, I, I, I work diligently, and I think God uh, allows me to try to break that stigma some. Yeah. You know, like being able to pastor at a place called Bridgepoint, mm-hmm. you know, stand in the pulpit. Like, I want people to understand that God can use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Now, you know? so 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 Bridgepoint's a, a like you know your typical church, right? Yes. You know, has a building, has people, yeah. does your normal Sunday, probably yeah. Wednesday things. But so what? What was your um, shock value? I guess or like the, wow, this is so different from like doing ministry, yeah, downtown, then going to the house, dealing with these guys, and now all of a sudden you're preaching at a church, yes. filling in for them as they're going through a transitional time, right? And they're looking to you to kind of be like a spiritual leader. Like, what was that like? Um, I, I think for me, um, 
Um, it was a good season in my life because I think that, like, where, uh, you know, we look at Paul and, like, I, I didn't ever believe that God would use me in that setting. Yeah. Um, like, when Paul was used as a Jew to reach the Gentiles. You know, so I questioned it for the first couple of months. Like, you know, is this where I'm supposed to be? God, is this what you called me to do? Um, you know, but God, God um, you know, worked that through that in a mighty way. I, I think they looked at me and saw and had a stereotype of what I was. Mm-hmm. And then they, then I would stand up in the pulpit and preach what I did. Mm-hmm. I, I think it really affected some people's mindsets, you know. Good. Um, so, you know, and, and I shake them up because I'm all about getting outside that bubble. Yeah. You know, and I, a lot of people, like, they, um, people, you know, churches get church locked, like, what you call a bubble. They get they get building locked. Like, oh, right, we got this nice, huge building now. We're just going to sit here. And, yeah, we and made get it. fat. You know yeah. what I mean? We made it. We've arrived. We're here. Right. Yeah, we yeah. did it. We made yeah. it. You know, and... Um, and then when that happens and, and the discipleship falls off, the evangelism falls off, we stop preaching our community. Um, and, I, and I think that in that, I, I helped to spur that along and get them back out of that, yeah. that square. You know? So it was a great time. It was a great learning experience for me. So I'm glad that I'm grateful to God that he gave me that experience. So Yeah. I was going to say, because I mean, they, they... it's a big difference between the parking lot <laughs> in the pulpit. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that took some adjustments. So God used that because, so I was leading two different ministries through COVID um, in that whole season. Yeah. Um, and then, like, it's funny how God works because I, I started in the pulpit in this nice, beautiful, like, sanctuary. And then we're in the parking lot again preaching on Sunday <laughs> morning. So I'm like, God, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, so it was cool. You know? And then the conversations you're having, I'm sure, with people in the church versus the conversations down at the house. Yeah. You know? Very much different. And I had to have grace. I, I, God taught me to have grace um, even um, for people um, that aren't struggling the way that I've seen people struggle. Mm-hmm. Like their struggles are real in their mind. Yeah. You know? So that, that was a learning experience. You know, so so the fix. Um, you guys are you guys are in King William. You got fifteen or sixteen guys in the house yeah. right now. Yeah, we got room for sixteen. But yeah, and um, I know that y'all told me before that y'all wanted to do a women's thing. Yes. So what's the plan there? Yeah. So like, um, very cool. I, I know um, my wife has a heart. You know, for the women, we get calls. She gets calls daily. I know uh, Pastor Jason's wife does too. Um, we're having to refer them out to different places where we can. Um, but you know, like we are completely funded by the local church mm-hmm. and also private, you know, people who donate to the ministry or tied to the ministry. Um, because we, you know, I, I won't take grant money cause I don't want the red on tape. Me. Yeah. You know, um, I don't want anybody to ever come to me and say, Fred, you can't teach that or you can't do this. Or, yeah. Um, and God's provided through that and I'm grateful um, but looking at the finances, you know, we going forward uh, with the women's program um, and the income that comes into the ministry, um, you know, I don't want to start something and have to close it down. So, yeah. like, in the interim of that, you know, we um, got in a place. We're going to start a thrift store that's missions-based. So all that will go back to the women's program. Now, where's that based at? That's going to be in King William, too. At the house? No, no. We got a um, we got a, about a fifty five hundred square foot um building right on three sixty. Nice. Um, that we're gonna do th- a thrift store. Tell people where's that. Um, so do you know the address? Nope. Okay. It's near Halterman's. Hal- Alterman. Halterman's. Halterman's. Jojo's Express. On three sixty. Uh, yeah. On three sixty. It's where Mechanics Karen's Hill. attic was. All right, so what I'll do is we'll get more specific. I'll put a link in the description of this yeah, video, so that way you know, when people are watching this section, they yeah. just scroll down, look at the description, yeah. and I'll put like some latitude, longitude, yeah. or maybe a, yeah. an actual dress up there for them. Yeah. So, so what we'll use that for is, um, you know, where we've got Christian businesses <clears throat> that are um, discipling the men, uh, they're working during mm-hmm. the day. That'll be a place for my wife and Jody, Jason's wife, to when we do get the women's house up and going, they can go there work, do class, get discipled, um, and that, you know, the women will run it. So it'll be good. It'll be good. So 
How long is a program for a guy when they come into it? Um, so we say a year to a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I don't believe that you can um, even uh, skim the surface. Sure. In 30 to 60, 90 days. I mean, that yeah. you don't even touch what's going on. Um, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a shotgun wound, is yeah. what I say. But, um, and we say 18 months, um, but it's, it's right around 12 months. If we have to do disciplinary action or, or something goes on, you know, we can keep them longer. But, it depends, too, on the guy. Yeah. You know, 12 months, we've had several people graduate after 12 months, but some people need... 18. A little bit more. <laughs> yeah. A little more sanctification. That's yeah. all right, though. Yeah. yeah. As long as they still graduate. Yeah. That's right. And so That's we've right. had, um, we, we're at about an eight, right now we're at about an 80% success rate with guys that graduate. That's pretty so, fantastic, though, if you, you think know, about it. We, we've, um, we've had, uh, well, we've got six now that's graduated, and we've had one that fell off, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, so um, it's, it's good, you know, and um, we check on them every day. It's like, um, they're like my kids. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, Your spiritual good, children. You know, yeah. and they come back and it's great. They give, they show up on Saturdays, they'll come and teach a class to the guys. It's, it's amazing. And, um, you know, we've, we, uh, had one guy that, uh, graduated recently that stayed on his staff. So that was, uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, so. You know, the next thing we're looking to is the women's program and then some transitional housing, um, you know, to where they finish the program, they get into a house, um, they start to pay their own bills. That's like, um, but they still have that accountability, you know. Moments of Hope, I'm sure y'all are familiar with them. Um, I don't know if they're doing it, but I've seen them post before about other organizations in like different cities that would build like these little tiny homes. Yes. Villages, yeah. Yeah, yes. like tiny home tiny villages. Home villages yeah. yeah, for the homeless people to kind of yeah. have that transition. Right. And uh, I mean... That's I, what we're trying to do on the property. Which for I... the guys. Yeah. You know, the graduates. So. Which I think is fantastic, right? Yeah. Like I, I think what a, what a great testimony it would be if like a church had... 30 right. acres, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, they could, Hey, yeah, we could build a five, you know, $5 yeah. million dollar building, yeah. but instead we're going to build a $2 million one. And then we're going to spend money on building these transitional, like, I mean, yes. you're talking like 500 yeah. square foot or something, like, you know, something pretty yeah, really so, small. And, so we got plans. We had an engineer that drew up some plans for the tiny homes mm-hmm. for us. And, um, they're about, about 600 square feet. They'll fit two guys very comfortable. Um, you know, and if we build eight or 10 of those out there on the property, that, that would be amazing. Because, That'd be awesome. You know, once the guys get a job outside of the ministry, a lot of guys don't have driver's licenses. Yeah. So we could provide transportation for them to and from um, and kind of help them out, get back on their feet and get adjusted. Because a lot of guys, like, they come off the street, they've never paid bills before. They've never balanced a checkbook. They've mm-hmm. never – I mean, they don't – they need life skills. Yeah. You know, That's other a good way than to just, it. hey, yeah. man, I've given my life to Christ. I've stayed in your program a year, Fred. Now what? Mm-hmm. So that that's the, that's what we're working on now is, is getting to a point where um, we can further not only their, their relationship with Christ, but how, how to live in the world. That's what, Proverbs, that's what Proverbs is all about, yeah, right? Uh, yeah. Living, living that smart life, yep. you know, not making those crazy mistakes yeah. and... A lot of financial advice in the book of Proverbs. For that very reason, you get yourself in financial, you know, hardships, right. and it it can mess your life up. Yeah, and see, a lot of guys, if they don't know how to cope with those things, mm-hmm. it'll lead them back to numbing themselves. Yeah, like get overwhelmed. I, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how to pay my rent. I, I don't know how I'm going to get to work. Yeah, and so, all of a sudden they can't pay their rent. They're back out on the street. Then they try to yeah cope with that through drugs okay. again, and yeah. everything's lost. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a total life change. You know, that's what we're going for, you know, so. Ministry ain't easy. No. <laughs> Let me tell you what right now. If you're thinking about getting into ministry, it's, a, it's the greatest job on the face of the planet. It's the hardest job on the face of the planet. Amen. Amen. Because it is but it, it, emotionally it's... draining at times. That's why I, I learned this a long time ago. It's yeah. one of the most spiritual things you can do is take a nap. <laughs> Don't tell him that. Listen, listen. <laughs> Jesus hey. fell asleep on a boat. Yep. Right? I he mean, believes he, in naps. Jesus yeah. took naps. There's yeah. a reason why Jesus sometimes said, fellas, let's go. Yeah. We got to go up here on this mountain away from all these people. people. Mm-hmm. We need to pray. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and sometimes, <laughs> like in ministry, like the one we're involved in, I mean, God gives you two hours, you better take it. Yeah. <laughs> this might I mean, be all seriously. you get in the next week. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> I've learned that, you know. You know, if, if I got a block of time where I ain't got nothing to do, it's time to take a nap. 
Hey. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you might get that 12 in, at night phone call, mm-hmm. and it lasts two hours, you know? <laughs> I think people greatly underestimate the value, not only emotionally, mm-hmm. but also just to your body. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, sometimes I'll find myself, uh, this. I used to do this in Maryland a lot too, but I do it even now. But yeah. in Maryland more so, like I'd be in the office, and I'd be, you know, I'd be studying a lot, yeah. right, because I taught a lot. So I get to a point, it's like mid-afternoon, it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I've been studying all day, I'm like, I'm like tired. Perfect you know? nap time. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, but here's the thing, though, right? You just you just let it go for like half an hour. Yeah. And then, boom, you're ready to rock and roll for the rest of the day. Yeah. But if you try to push through that, you might push through it, but you're really not efficiently pushing through no. it. And then, like, you know, you, you, you know, if you're not properly rested, especially in ministry, it affects the way you minister to people. Mm-hmm. Oh, you get cranky your, in ministry. Your irritability. Yeah. You know, and, like, that happens, you know? So you got to learn to detach. Like, if, if, I'm, if I'm not feeling um, a certain way um, when I come to somebody, then I won't go to them. Yeah. Because if I, if I don't have the proper rest or I'm not in the right frame of mind... That'll come across in the wrong way. It's very few conversations that you need to have, like right here, right now. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, I mean, if you got to table it for a minute, it's okay. Yeah, table it. And see that that's that's been um, social media's made that bad too because people have gotten this mindset like, I want to deal with this and I want to deal with it right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, people like it's an and addiction. If you don't, it, we have a problem. Yeah, it's the addiction of like you know, okay, I, I pull up in the drive-through ready to get my get my coffee. Yeah. My brain, my brain stops thinking about whatever for like five seconds. Right. So I got to check social media. Yeah. You know, so now I'm checking social media and now yeah. somebody, somebody commented on my thing. Yeah. Oh, I got to comment back right now. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Absolutely. You know? And I think that takes away from um, us being still and being with God. Mm-hmm. You know, because I really believe if we couldn't respond instantaneously or have these instantaneous conversations... We would work through our feelings. We'd work through our emotions. We'd go to God, mm. and then we then 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 God's perfect timing. Yeah. Instead of our timing. Yeah. So, I think that's a good point. I think you know, if you are a Christian who is active on social media, yeah, which you probably are if you're watching this, right? Then you might need to think about taking time to go to God first before you right. respond back. That's it. Yeah, and I and I think for me, like I, I I personally just being straight up can get caught up on followers and friends lists, likes. Yeah, and then instead of like forcing something and, and letting just let God speak to me before I just post some something out of trying to get yeah more followers, more likes, and just letting God you know orchestrate all that because. I can tell you, I've pushed through sermons, I've pushed through speaking events um, in a way that God wasn't speaking, I know it was me. Yeah. You know, instead of sitting still and just letting God, you know, do it. Fred did it. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know. It's easy to, um, it's easy in ministry to get caught up in the mindset that like, it's, it's based on your efforts. Yeah. Like there's, there's definitely a, there's a partnership. Yeah. You know, God doesn't do like doesn't God doesn't just take you over like a robot, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. But at the same time, like if you think that you are accomplishing this by your might, yeah, you're wrong. I mean, the the Bible clearly says, "Not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit." Thus says the Lord. Right. Like He's the one who's going to accomplish this. Now, if you want to be a part of that, right? He'll let you be a part of it. Yep. You know, and He'll use you as a vessel. But at the same time, if you think that you're the one by your intellect, by your work, by your Whatever it is, you yeah. think you're going to get this thing accomplished? Like, I think sometimes what God will do is He'll give us those reality checks of letting us hit those failures to go. <laughs> just remember, yeah, like who's the one who's accomplishing all this stuff? Yeah. That's right. You know, people forget that. So I mean, that I think it, so. Full circle, right? It yeah. goes back to if you have that humble attitude and you're willing to say, "God, use me," right? And you know, it's not based off of what I can do. It's not based off of my intellect or my talents, my abilities. Yeah. It's just me saying, God, you use me. I'm here. I'm, I'm going to be ready to be used as a vessel for you. He can use anybody yeah. right. from any background. I agree. You know, and I mean, yep. you two guys are an example of that coming from, you know, your backgrounds, you know, where some people might just count you out completely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
and say maybe they might be able to get into the kingdom of God by the by the skin of their teeth, right? You know, but instead now you guys are leading a ministry, and not just leading a ministry, but you're also leading a growing ministry. Yeah. You know, that's one thing that like I wanted to have you guys on is because it's like I want y'all to continue to grow. Yeah, I want people to know more about you. I want people who know people who need to be in the fix. To know right. about the fix. Sure. You know, I, and, and I want people who are in Richmond to know about what y'all are doing in Richmond so y'all can go be a part of it. Yeah. You know, so where do y'all meet at in Richmond? Um, it's 212 North 18th Street. So it's a parking lot that we lease from the city, which is directly behind the Exxon on Broad in mm-hmm. the bottom. Should I go bottom? Mm-hmm. Um, and we meet there Tuesdays at 5 and Sundays at 5. Okay. So that's a good time. You know, it it's, is. A, it's a way to, it's a, it's great because we, we've made some gospel partnerships with, um, local churches that they'll come down on some Sundays, to serve the meals now. Um, and it's a great place to bring a team. Yeah. Um, uh, so you can, you know, they can learn some really hands-on, um, you know, evangelism, mm-hmm. you know, missions. And how to, missions like yeah, we always talk people. about going on mission trips. We, yeah. we have yeah. a mission right down in Richmond. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's close. You know, and it's it's amazing. I I, I have seen uh, God work miracles in that parking lot. So, well, and know. so again, it goes back to kind of what we were talking about earlier. I'm not trying to be super critical right. of like people who are because not everybody who's in a church is bad or yeah. as you know right, like right. is whatever. Like I'm not we're not trying to portray no, the that. local church is everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We like yeah. you, you guys love the local church. Yeah. I love the local church. Sure, yeah. God we loves the do local it, church. We do without it. Yeah. You know, there's always yeah. tweaking that needs to happen to make yeah. the lo- the local church better. Yes, you know. But with that being said, you know, if you're a Christian, if you go to a local church, you know, if you're a part of it, you're near Richmond. Like, y'all yeah. need to go down and visit it. Like, yeah. I've been down there, you know. Yes. Um, my wife has been down there plenty of times. We look forward to getting back, to being right. part of it. Um, you know, Tuesday nights at 5, Sunday nights y'all do the meal, yep. right at 5. five. And, and we um, do meals on Tuesdays, too. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, but, but my point is, it's like, you know, with everything uh, in the media right. about what's going on in Richmond. Yeah. You know, people want to rant and rail about all that stuff. Why don't instead you get off social media, go down and actually be the hands and feet of the gospel yes. in Richmond. That's yeah. it. And get part of, right. you know, this ministry is down there. Now, do y'all have a specific name for that? Because I know the fix is a thing out in Yeah, Kingdom. so like the fix ministry, um, uh, and, and then we call it City Lighthouse Mission. So City it's Lighthouse like a, an outreach of the fix. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, but you know we like again we poke we, we partner with the local church because like what I've seen down there is, um, people come to Christ, right? Homelessness, drug addiction. We have a way to deal with the drug addiction, but if the local churches would uh, get more involved, right? Um, it it would be a way for a local church to start to disciple people into the church. Yeah. I mean, really, because right. we, you know, we can't bring them to the cross and leave them there. Mm. That's not the Great Commission. Nope. Um, so you have to make disciples. So, like, if local churches come and they get involved and they start pouring in these people's lives, y- you'll find out that, man, one day you're going to have a, a productive church member, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it, it's a collective effort. And it's broader than just one person's kingdom. It's God's kingdom. Listen, you know I, I, mean? I, I couldn't agree with you more. Again, that's one of the main things that yeah. like God laid on my heart about this podcast is it's like, listen, it's not just about what you're doing, Billy. Yes. You know, and that's why I was like, you know, if I'm going to do this podcast and put effort into it, I want it to be about yeah. let me give promotion to what other people are doing in the kingdom. Yeah. yeah. And let, let God right. promote them. You know, that's going to be one of my ministries from here going forward. You yeah. know, Lord willing, right? Yeah. right? And hopefully, it's kingdom. It's kingdom hopefully, body. this grows not for me, right? Right, but for the sake of a all these form for ministry, all these other people I'm going to be having on. Yeah, hopefully in the future we'll we'll get that exposure, and then they will be able to grow. Because who right. knows? Yeah. Who knows the one person out there that might be listening right now that could yeah. go partner out with a fix, and then yeah. Right. You know, whatever you guys are out on. Yeah. And like you said, we want to, we want people in the local churches to know not only do we want them to partner with us, we want them to know we're a resource. Mm-hmm. Yes. Maybe they have a family member. Maybe they have somebody in their congregation yep. who's struggling with drugs and alcohol and homelessness. They can, we're a resource for them. There's right. not a lot in the area. So. It's, a, it's a great point because not every church is 500, 1,000, you know, right. has members, has a big congregation. 
you know, what if you have a church of like 50 people out in right. Goochland or something, yeah. you know? And it's like, they don't have any, I, I, I don't right. know. I, I'm just saying like, what if they right. don't have a trained counselor or they don't yeah. have that, they don't have all that ability, Yeah, you know, and then go, but I do know. Yeah. That's the beauty of the kingdom That's of God. It. Yes. That's it. Being able to partner with each other. Yeah. That's right. So there it is, the Fixed Ministry. Do you guys have a website? Yep. Thefixedministry.org. Fixedministry.org. Yeah. We'll put a link of that in the description. Yeah. Um, and then the City Lighthouse Mission, Mission. Mm-hmm. is the one downtown. Yeah. yeah. Right. So and it's all encompassed under the fix. Yeah. yeah. So people can check that out. Yeah. And then if people want to uh, connect with you guys, y'all are on social media platforms. Yes. Yep. Right. Now, does the, the fix have its own social media? Yes. Yes. Okay. What is the fix what? ministry? All right. We'll put some links to those as on well. Facebook. And Instagram. And Instagram. Okay. So, so. we'll put some links to those in the yep. description. And then Fred and Casey. Yeah. Look them up as well. Yeah. Thank yep. you, man. Amen. For having us. Awesome. Thank you guys for coming on. Appreciate, appreciate y'all. You. Yep. All right.